fellowship great meet and greet this is the day the what and we're gonna do what rejoice and be glad just take about five seconds and go ahead and do that amen come on go ahead and rejoice and give God praise for kingdom of the arts and media festival are you glad to be here tonight come on it's opening time come on it's time for us to grow in the kingdom it's time for us to have our capacity enlarged right for our intelligence to grow, amen to that. It's time for us to see God unfold another facet of himself over so over a few days of engagement, a few days of insight. And ladies and gentlemen, God is so faithful. He's so faithful to this house. He's so faithful to us because he gives us leaders who have a kingdom of God perspective. Now, for those of us who have a history of seeing how the unfolding of the kingdom of God's message has occurred through the Door of Hope and through CCFM, one of the great things that we have, we have to acknowledge, and Bishop referenced it in the office earlier, is that the revelation has increased and sharpened and clarified, but we didn't have to go back and change anything. Aren't you glad that God has a multi-decade revelation? that he is unfolding at the door of hope in the CCFM. Amen to that. No, I think you need to give God a praise a little bit more for that. Because we've had multi-decades of revelation and insight flowing from the kingdom of God. And quite candidly, it's not always easy for that to happen within a Pentecostal context. Come on, somebody say amen real good right there. That reveals the uniqueness of the revelation that God has given to the man of God and the ability to execute it with wisdom and with conviction. Because the kingdom of God isn't an add-on. The kingdom of God isn't peripheral to the meal. It is the meal. Our bishop says often we preach about what Jesus preached, but we don't preach what Jesus preached. Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom. And the good news of his kingdom has influence in every sector of society. Somebody say every sector. That means no matter what context, no matter what division, no matter what emphasis, there is a revelation of the kingdom of God that is appropriate for that area so that the kingdom of God and the glorification of Jesus can occur in that area. God can use you and wants to use you like an Esther, like a Daniel, or like a Joseph. Because each one of us, there is a sector in your soul awaiting for the unfolding of the kingdom of God. I'm going to try that one more time. There is a sector of your soul that is waiting for the unfolding of the kingdom of God. That means within you, amen to that, within you, within me, Jesus said the kingdom of God is where? Within you. And the expression of the kingdom of God is through your work, through your family, through your talent, skill, and ability. It's not something we do just on Sunday or just on Tuesday or just on Thursday. But the things that we do daily, we're supposed to be salt and light there. Salt and light. Now here's what's interesting as we get ready to pray. Salt doesn't become what it is placed upon. It influences what it is placed upon. Bible says that God wants us to beware in the world, but not what? Of the world. 
Lamb is one of my favorite foods to eat. Uh oh, I heard it. Come on, God. Amen to that. I ain't got no other witnesses, but it's all right. Amen. Hang out with turkey and chicken. Amen. There's, there's, you know, we, 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 we ain't not doing a meat contest. But all I'm saying is when I put salt on it, salt doesn't become lamb. It enhances it. It flavors it. It preserves it. But it doesn't become it. I'm telling you that God wants you as salt and light in the world. That means wherever he sprinkles you, wherever, whatever sector that is, you're not there to become that sector. You're there to influence that sector. Amen to that. So look to your neighbor and say, there is saltiness on the inside of you. Now ask them, we're sprinkling that in arts and media. Say, say we're sprinkling that in arts and media. Does that make sense? Y'all want to laugh real quick before I pray? This is, you know, so when Bishop um, had, you know, asked me to come with my wife, you know, normally we'll kind of come in and out for arts and media, that kind of thing, depending on what the assignment is, et cetera, and depending on what the schedule, we kind of dart in, dart out. And, and so, so I, when I told her I was coming, she was not able to be here tonight. She was actually working, coming from the hospital. And she said, I know you're not talking about arts. <laughs> I said, sweetheart, if I needed to, I could. But that's not my assignment. I said, the prefix is what? Kingdom of God. I said, I can talk about that all day long. Does that make sense? So you don't have to be, quote unquote, an arts person or a media person. But all of us are called to understand how the kingdom of God influences arts and media. Because every single day, in some capacity or another, we're in, we're what? We're participating. Y'all not doing me right. It's okay. Some of y'all got y'all watch list ready right now. Amen. So we're participating in it. And at bare minimum, we need to be able to recognize where salt is and where salt needs to be. Amen to that? Squeeze your neighbor's hand. Let's pray tonight. Father, we give you praise. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for... You said that signs and wonders follow the word. As Jesus preached and taught the kingdom, signs followed. As we teach and as Bishop shares and as the clinicians and the other guests come in and impart and instruct, let signs and wonders follow the instruction of the kingdom of God. Let us see breakthroughs in mind, in heart, and in life. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we see the world more clearly and we see our participation in the world more clearly. Oh God, let the power of the Holy Ghost disrupt our prior patterns of thought in any way that was contradictory to the spirit unfolding the kingdom of God. Break down every matrix that's in contradistinction to the purpose of God manifesting in our lives. Reveal to us every stronghold of the enemy that is preventing us from unfolding the kingdom of God in a greater way in our lives. Oh God, touch every clinician and every seminarian and every participant who has yet to arrive, but yet they are in route, yet they're on planes or cars. Lord, superintend over their transportation. Let not anything hinder them from being a blessing to this gathering. And lastly, Father, provoke in us a hunger that we may not have had before. Stimulate within us an appetite that we may not have had before. Oh God, let something stir and be provoked in our soul in such a way that God, we would not easily lose. We would not easily forget. But this word and this environment and this experience, let it linger with us. Let it linger with us. Let it sink deeply into our ears and let it be etched upon the tables of our heart. In Jesus' name. If you 
believe that, would you begin to lift your hands and lift your voices and the door will open and begin to give God praise for real? Come on, we're going to transition to the next part of our gathering tonight. But come on, lift your hands and let your own ears hear your mouth say something to God. Come on, let your own ears hear your own mouth say something to God. Even if it's simply Jesus, Jesus, or bless the Lord, oh my soul, or to God be the glory, or hallelujah, blessed be the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your voices tonight and bless the Lord. Come on, let God feel the anticipation of your heart tonight. Yes, it's a seminar, but it's still the kingdom of God, and therefore signs and wonders follow the word if you believe God for signs and wonders and mighty deeds to follow the word tonight let 30 more seconds of a great expectation hit the house tonight hallelujah come on glorify the name of the Lord come on praise be the name of the Lord come on hallelujah we glorify you are king and you are lord you are king and you are lord you are sovereign and you are land owner the earth is yours and the fullness thereof and we glorify you that you have put it in stewardship of the works of our hands come on look to your neighbor and say i've got great expectation Come on, look to your neighbors. and say, I've got great expectation. Hallelujah. Have a seat just for a moment as you keep that expectation of praise. I want to read this into your hearing, and then we will present our pastor, our bishop, our leader tonight. And I just want to read this brief scripture. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And this is Deuteronomy 29 and 29. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Let me repeat that, the secret things belong to who? The Lord. But the things revealed belongs to us and to our children forever. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that through this iteration of the kingdom of God and arts and media festival, I believe God is going to reveal some secret things. Oh, come on. I know there's somebody in expectation. Come on. I believe God is going to allow the covers to be pulled off of some secret things. I believe God is going to not create things, but pull the covers off of what? Secret things. When you take the cover off of something, when there's an unveiling, that thing was already there. The removal of the cover is called what? Revelation. You're showing what was once what? Cloaked, masked, or hidden. What if? There is a creativity. And how about this one, Door of Hope? What if there's a wisdom God wants to unlock for you? Oh, come on here. What if there's an area of wisdom that while you are participating in the festival, God shows you something with your right brain for you to carry out with your left brain? Y'all not I need somebody that, who was really here. What if God can unlock something in your spirit that will hit your right brain creativity? That you can then carry out with left brain execution. Are you That can change your life forever. Look to the person beside you and smile at them real good and say, I believe I received that. Come on, tell somebody else that I believe I received that. Now, while you were that expectation, come on, stand to your feet and give God praise for our pastor, our bishop, the convener, the host, the instigator of this great gathering, the Kingdom of God Arts and Media Festival. Let's receive 
our pride presiding brother, Bishop Michael Anthony Blue. Come on, do a little bit better than that tonight. We're going to worship the Lord for a moment, but let the Lord know we're grateful for allowing us to have one of his choice vessels in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank God for the privilege. We're going to honor the Lord uh, in song for just a moment before we go to the word. We're going to honor the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. We sing praises to your name. Thank you. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I want you to lose sight on everything and everybody and focus on him. Lift your hand. We sing praises to your name. Sing to him. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. For your name is great, for your name is great, and greatly to be praised. We sing praises to your name. Lift it up. Praises to your name. Oh. Say something to him right there. Lift your voices and tell God something right there. I don't hear some of you. Lift your voices and praise him. Hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name. For your name is great. And greatly to be praised. Hallelujah to your name. Oh Lord, hallelujah to your name. Mm. Thank you. For your name is great and great. We sing praises, we sing praises to your name. To your name, oh, Lord. your name is great. For oh, your name, name is great. and greatly to be praised. That melody will become the alto line. Soprano, you will sing one line above. Tenors, one beneath. Come on, everybody, sing the song. We sing great to your name. Come on.
sing praise. Praise to your name. Yes, sir. Praise to your name. Praise to your name. For your name is great. Come on. For your name. Lift your hands and honor the Lord. Lift your hands and honor the Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Sing it. To worship all oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my king. Take joy, my king. In what you hear. And let it be a sweet sound. Be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Hallelujah. Do you love him? If you love the Lord, sing it again. I love you, Lord. Sing it. Come on. I love you, Lord. So proud as I'm singing your part. And I lift my voice. Everyone sing your part. Come on. A sound. Somebody make a sound. Come on, tell him something. And let it be a sweet sound. And let it be a sweet, oh, yes. sweet sound. Thank you. Come on. Make a sound. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. And let Oh Lord, we glorify you and let it be a sweet, sweet, let sweet sound. In your ear, yeah. Oh. And let it be a sweet sound. And let it be a sweet, yeah. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Sing it to him. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Sing it out to me. I love you, Lord. And bless him right there. Bless him. Oh, 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 oh. We give you glory. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, church. Come on and give him something.
Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Everyone tell him. And let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And let it be a sweet. And let it be a sweet. Jesus, you have it in your heart. Thank you. Hallelujah. God bless you. Tell him thank you. Tell him something right there. Just before we go to, that's right, keep a prayer. If you have one, keep a praise. The Bible says, oh shy, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs making melody in your heart unto the Lord. And then the Bible says, this is an arts meeting, correct? Among other things, it is a kingdom of God meeting, but we're emphasizing aspects of the kingdom and the arts is one of those categories. Then in Colossians chapter three and verse 16, media, if you can pull those verses, uh, Colossians three sixteen says, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. That's the Ephesians text. And the Colossians, Ephesians and Colossians are like twin epistles. And so um, Colossians 3.16 says something that sounds very similar, it, but, but instead of emphasizing the spirit as Ephesians does, it emphasizes the word. That lets you know that the word and the spirit work together, amen. And the Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Isn't it interesting? Sing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Isn't it interesting that in the Ephesians text, it says, be filled with the spirit, speak to yourself. Be filled with the word, speak to others. You see it? Singing both times. The spirit filled time you're singing to yourself. With the word filled time, you're speaking to one another. Hallelujah. And um, I, uh, I, I was um, in a situation not long ago and um, it looked as if there was something that was important to me that had, it had eluded me, it had gotten out of my hands, out of my grasp. And it was very frustrating to me because um, it's not that I was careless, but somehow this thing got away from me. And it was very valuable. And um, I, I was really frustrated about it. And, and I said to the Lord, you know, I looked everywhere I knew to look and did everything I knew to do. And then I said to the Lord, you know, I, what can I do? I mean, that's, that's it. And so to make a long story short, I did everything I knew to retrieve. And right at the last, most ridiculous moment, the most unlikely moment of all, God restored. God restored. He restored. And, and um, many of the songs that you hear us saying um, 
many of the songs that you, particularly during the prayer time and so forth, the choruses that um, the Lord gave me, or maybe I gave the Lord. How I many know it can work both ways? In other words, in other words, He can place something in your spirit, and then the other times where you just say something to Him because you want to say something, and and it might come out melody. That's what He said, making melody in your heart. It may sound like a mess in somebody else's ear, but it's melody in my heart. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. And um, in that instance, I began to sing this chorus. When I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know what to do, somehow, some way, you came through. That's not deep, that's not intricate, that's not, you know, anything major, but that's what I, 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 I sang it to him, and right to this very day, I'm still singing it to him. When, when I get a, a moment, you know, of release. Come on. When I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to do. But somehow, some way, you came through. I wish I was a good quartet singer. I, I, come on. Come on, brethren. You hear the beat, don't you? Don't you hear the beat? Let me hear you drum up. Come on, let me hear you. That's it. Come on. Come on, you can, you can join, come on. When I didn't know what to say, when I didn't know what to do, somehow, some way, you came through. Now, I just want to ask you this, because the Bible said teaching and admonishing one another. I just want to ask you, has God ever come through for you? When it seemed like you were going to pull your little hair out, when it seemed as if you were going to just be told, exasperated, hallelujah. Tell him, don't tell me now, tell him. Tell him. When I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know what to do, tell him this. Somehow, some way, you came Come on. When I didn't know what to say, Lord, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. But somehow, some way, you came through. I want you to testify to somebody. Tell somebody the same thing. When I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know what to just put it in the third person. That's all you have to do. Somehow, someone say he came. Come on, he came. He came. That's it right there. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lord. Yes, Lord. We're just going to sing it one more time. Come on. Tell the Lord when I didn't know what to say. I didn't know right here somehow some way mm -hmm. tell him somehow some way somehow some way come on one more time one more time somehow some way yeah you can stay right there stay right there that's it come on that's it that's it come on come on Come on. Some of you been shaking hands with me and you didn't know that I had my melody going on in my spirit. You in the truck and you didn't know that I was singing to the Lord. Somehow, some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somehow, some way. Yeah, yeah, somehow. tell you this there's a little more you know because songs begin to make themselves but we're not doing that tonight we're not doing that tonight but is there anyone who has a he came through testimony no 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 see I'm looking at some of y'all it just says dry why don't you keep your mouth closed but if there's anybody who came through a tight place and I mean you, 
if you weren't sweating, you could have almost begun to sweat. Palms and everything else. But right there at the, I, I didn't play it like that though. I didn't play it like that, did I? When I didn't know what to say, and I, see, rewind, rewind, I, I, I wasn't playing it like that, because I'm thinking about, I was under pressure. That, that, that wasn't no, 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 uh -huh, it wasn't, it wasn't no. Anybody been pressed? Sing it. When I didn't know what to say, mm. and I didn't know what to do, mm. somehow, somewhere, you came through. All I want you to do is find somebody who has a you came through testimony. Shake two or three hands and tell them he will come through. He will come through. He will come through. I know that I know that I know that I know. Hey. Oh Lord, somehow, some way. You know, I wish this was a shouting service tonight because I could honor the Lord with a shout. Tell him, somehow, some way. Go back to the first person. Somehow, some way, you came through. Clap your hands if you know he comes through. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I didn't have an organ. I didn't have a drum or a keyboard. Certainly didn't have a microphone. But he came through. Tell somebody near you, we're going to sit down now. Shake a hand and say, we're going to sit now. But tell him, oh, he will come through. Turn it around and say, oh, he will come through. You didn't say it, you didn't say it. Put some sharps in it and say, oh, he will, he will, he will, he will, he will come through. Come on, old church. I said, I know he will. Be seated, tell us about it. I know he will. I didn't hear y'all say anything over there. I said, I know he will. Find somebody, find somebody and say, I know he will. That's it. Please be seated. Go like me. Go like me. Bishop, I didn't know what to say. Didn't know what to do. But somehow, today, somehow, some way, some way, some way, Lord. I wish I had some old church saying to you, please be seated, be seated. Some way, Lord. Be seated, be seated. Somehow, some way, he came through. Oh, yes, I feel like praying. Come on, Facebook. Come on, YouTube. Come on, website. Somehow, some way. Oh, some way, somehow. All right, you may be seated. Yes. Amen. You may talking about I, I'm talking about that helpless feeling that can come you understand what 
you've done, you've, ex you've exhausted every possible option. But somehow, some way, you may be seated, I'm seated. You may be seated. Jesus. Ah. Mm. Yes, sir. You can you you can sit down. Mm. Yes, Lord. Just decide to be seated. It'll work if you decide to be seated. That, that's it, brethren. Decide to be seated. I didn't say desire, I said decide. God forevermore. Thank you, sir. Yes. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. So, see, um, this is an arts meeting, and and worship has art in it. Praise has art in it. There's an art to it. There's a science to it. And if you're going to learn and retain our heritage, you, you, if you go back, there are some videos left. And some people are still doing it actively today. If you go back to devotional service in the days of old, in, in the old days of old, in many settings, they didn't even stand and sing. They, they, they would sit. And then after a while, when they couldn't stand it anymore, they'd get up, you understand? But many times, they, they start out seated. If it wasn't, or whatever, for the Lord, you understand? All right, okay. Now, here's the thing, here's the thing. So, so while you're sitting, I want you to do like they did. I, 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 wish, I, could, I wish I could replay Deacon James Curry from New, New uh, 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 Lord, New Hope, New Hope. Ladders. I wish I could replay him for you. But he, he would have been one of those because he was sitting in the deacon board corner, you know. And he would have been, he always looked around. I mean, he, he knew everything that was going on. And uh, he would have been one of those who would have looked around and said, Well, I didn't know what to say. And uh, I didn't know what to do. And he looked straight at somebody and said, Somehow, some way. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? And so, so I, I, I want you to learn. I told you to be seated. Find somebody and look at them. Don't get up. Don't get up. Just look at them. Look at them. I don't know what key we're in. We're going to find a key, aren't we, brethren? Let's give us a key. Shake somebody's hand and tell them, when I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know what to do, wood floor, scrub board, bass drum, Echoing all across the building. Somehow, some way, where the old church, he came through. We're not going to do it. problems is some of you you do this in the house and haven't learned to do it in your house but what really works is in your house 
That's when he comes through. Somehow, some way, Lord. Oh, Lord. Grab those hands and say, Oh, Lord. I know you will come through. Be seated. Yes. Be seated. Yeah, Lord. That's it. That's it. So that's the arts segment for tonight. That's the arts segment for tonight. Amen. All right. We greet all of you in the matchless name, the incomparable name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, it is always our aspiration, intention to glorify and honor the Lord. And um, I'm going to ask media. Media has a little clip from maybe 2015, I believe, 14, 15, somewhere down in there. A Kingdom of God seminar that sort of gives a little bit more of an introduction to the perspective that we're attempting to live tonight. Uh, Brother Timothy Newton Jr. or the second, and he has lots of different titles, administrator, youth minister, psalmist, uh, MD, number of things. But uh, we were with them on Friday and we talked a little bit from the book of Matthew. Everybody, if you have your Bible, quickly turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew uh, chapter 6 Matthew chapter 6 verse 22 Matthew 6 22 reads the light of the body is the eye okay now I know it can be difficult for us to pull from where we were to where we need to be but but I want you to, let's love the Lord with all our minds as well, okay? Uh, 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 media, you all can rest. You all can rest. It, it sounds wonderful, but uh, you all can rest. If you don't, it'll prompt some of us to go another way. All right? Verse 22 says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. Um, the word light means leading influence here. It means the leading influence. Um, because now Jesus is speaking colloquially. He's speaking, he's speaking, uh, as my pastors would say, and the Lord would say, in a language that the people could understand. The, the light of the body is the eye. How many know and understand that we really don't see with our eyes. We see through, but we really don't see with. The light is an orifice. The light is a portal. The light is a passageway, a receptor. The eye is a passageway, a portal, by means of which Light comes and stimulates the optic nerve, and the nerve sends messages to the brain. The brain interprets those messages as images, and distance, and depth, and height, and all of those pieces. And so you actually see with your brain. Yes. There's a certain kind of brain damage that could occur and your eyes are totally untouched and you still wouldn't be able to see because you see with your brain, you see through your eye. And so the eye becomes, again, the orifice, it becomes the portal, it becomes the um, entryway, the passageway for light 
to enter. So when he says the light of the body is the eye, here's the application. Whatever the leading influence is of your life, okay, if therefore that I be single, the word single there means healthy or whole. If your, let's say it this way, if your perspective is whole or healthy, your whole body, that is your whole life, shall be full of light, full of revelation, full of understanding, full of proper per perception. Um, okay, now, from this point on, you don't have to say amen or anything unless we ask you. Now, you can, but don't feel obligated. You know, in a preaching service, you feel obligated. You've been trained that way. But what I'm saying is I want you to understand, so you don't have to say a whole lot from this point forward. If we go back to you came through, you got to say something. But other one. Now, perspective. The purpose for this meeting is perspective. The purpose for this whole Kingdom of the Arts uh, and Media Festival is perspective. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that part of what God has called me to do, particularly as it relates to teaching the Kingdom of God, is to help people with perspective. All right? This device that I'm holding in my hand has a number of common terms that re refer to it. Glasses is probably the most common. But there's another. Spectacle. The root spec means to see. Perspective is how one sees. Alright? Um, perspective determines perception. How one sees determines what one sees. Um, if these were sunglasses, they're transitional, but if they were straight up sunglasses and they were tinted pink, once I put them on, everybody and everything is a shade of pink. But not really. Pink is my perspective. You still the color you always were, but my perspective adds something to how I see you. And as it is true in the natural, so it is true in the ideological, in the psychological, in the mental, cognitive. All of us have lenses. None of us see reality as it is. I know we think we do. I know we think we do. Because that's natural. The challenge is, even though we think we do on the one level, as long as you don't believe you do, you're safe. When you start believing that you see reality as it is, the next thing you're going to believe is that nobody else does but you. And now we're into pride or conceit. Um, no, all of us are striving to cleanse the lens. The Bible says, for now we see through a glass darkly. Or in other words, we all have a tent that we bring to whatever it is that we see. And when we say see now, again, we're not talking about physical. We're talking about perspective. We're talking about, um, there's a term that we'll be using tonight, worldview. Worldview, if you're making notes, that's a good place to make one. Worldview is the sum total of our ideas, our values, our beliefs. It can also be affected by things like ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, political leanings. All of those things come together and form a matrix, form a lens through which we see and interpret the world around us. And all of us need to be conscious of the fact that we have a worldview and conscious of the fact that others have worldviews that may differ from ours and that many times although both of us are looking at the same thing we don't see the same thing we're viewing the same thing but we're not seeing the same thing you know, there's a passage in Proverbs that says the seeing eye 
and the here and here, the Lord hath made even both of them. Okay. God give us clear sight, clear vision, clear perspective. Have you ever noticed that if people have been traumatized around a certain area, they see that area as painful or threatening or not worthy of their trust? Whether that trauma came through a man, came through a woman, you understand? Came based on ethnicity, came based on gender, marital status, came in the context of formal education, wherever and however that trauma came, it begins to, if a person is not uh, uh, really delivered and kept by the power of God, it begins to affect the lid. It tints. The lens. Don't, don't you see how that is? All right. I read today, and we're going to get this little clip. I, I read today that um, in the United States, apparently, 20 of our states, 20 of them, have legislature pending that would allow physician-assisted suicide. This is not in one of the European nations. This is the United States. 20 states, if I read it accurately, have legislation pending with the prospect, not, not that they're going to do it, but with the prospect of a physician's assisted suicide. You know what suicide is, don't you? All right, physician assisted, the doctor's going to help you. The doctor. In other words, legislation that make it legal for you to request of the doctor to help me kill myself. Okay, now, I said to uh, one of our officers earlier today, I said, now, here in South Carolina, I don't know, I didn't see the list of states, so I don't know which state it was, but I said to one of our officers, uh, sitting here in the country, it will be easy for us to say, child, i tell you one thing, that won't come to South Carolina. That, that, that's probably one of the extremely blue states, you know, that probably won't come to South Carolina. But, but I said to that officer, here's the thing, who made such a decision? Who, who would even embrace the possibility? Who would, even, who would even conceive of such an idea? I, I, I submit to you that it's probably not the people that we're thinking of when we say that wouldn't happen in South Carolina. So all we need is for the people we're thinking of in South Carolina, let them get old and die. Yeah. Or let them decide that they no longer want to hold their legislative positions and, 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 and fight that grueling political process. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't take but a generation for a nation's values to almost be totally inverted and ideas that we thought we would never embrace become so normative that for you to say something contrary makes you look like the villain. And listen, you know we're living through that right now. We are living through a major shifting of perspective, shifting of values, what's virtuous or not. That's shifting right now. And those of you who have a little age on you, 20 plus, 30 plus, and above, you know, most of you know, you have an anchor in how you were trained, how you were raised, the examples that you saw, that even if you do crazy, you know crazy when you see it. And you also have enough breadcrumbs left. Come on, Hazel and Gretel. You got enough pebbles left that you know how to get back home. But many of our younger young do not have the discernment. Crazy for them, what we're calling crazy rather, for them is normal.
There's nothing outrageous about it. What's outrageous is that you have a problem with it. And so the response is not to fuss. The response is not to uh, malign or merely to rebuke. The response is we've got to challenge people with regard to first knowing you have a set of lenses. This is not reality. This is a perspective of reality. Now, let's examine where did you get that perspective? Was that source of perspective a reliable, trustworthy source? Is there a perspective that is more reliable and more trustworthy? What is the natural, logical outcome of following that perspective that you have embraced now? What's that going to look like in five years? What, what's that going to look like if it's followed in 10 years? And so our responsibility, brothers and sisters, I, I feel pressed and impressed of the Lord to revisit some of the fundamentals with regard to the kingdom of God because kingdom of God is where our perspective comes from. Please, brothers and sisters, hear God's heart. Our perspective is predicated upon the fact that our God created all things, owns all things. He is perfectly holy and just, righteous and just. He is perfectly loving. And he is our template. He is our model. He is our prototype. He is our pattern. He is our example. And therefore, his values his virtues, his perspective is the only perspective that is truly valid, that is truly reliable, that is truly trustworthy. Our aim is to try to get a better grip on God's perspective and then live our lives based upon that perspective. Does that make sense to you? That's the crux of why we're here. We're here to be humble enough to say, I don't know it all. I don't see it all clearly. God, give me what you promised the church at Laodicea if they would let you. Give us eye salve. Give us medicine for our eyes that we might be able to see. Let, let's get this little clip, and after that, Bishop Benjamin is, is going to facilitate um, what, what will end up being a conversation to some extent. And I want you to think in terms of questions because I hope that, that by the end of this, during this, you'll have questions. And perhaps at the end we can field um, a few of them as well. We cannot cover everything. You know that to start with. But hopefully this will, will whet and sharpen your appetite to let's make sure that when we hear terms and use terms like kingdom of God, we're not just saying what somebody else said. Amen. There's a fundamental difference between a prophet and a puppet. A prophet and a parrot. Some who claim to be prophets are merely puppets and parrots. All right. Let's get this clip. Shake somebody's hand and tell them the light of God in you includes the gift that he's placed within you. Natural gift, if you're not born again yet. And supernaturally divine gift, if you are born again. But in either case, you are created directly by God. And he has put some abilities in you. Or he has put the capacity in you to receive certain abilities. Be they blatant or latent, they are in you to govern on his behalf. Your gifting is for governing. You ought to thank him for that. You ought to thank him for that. There is some aspect of God's kingdom where you are to exercise his dominion. And if 
you've chosen rightly, it coheres with your career. If you've chosen rightly, it, it is according to your vocation. God wants you to discover, and, and, and this, this meeting is all about discovery. God wants you to discover your divinely ordained work so that you won't waste your life in an arbitrarily picked job. There is a divinely ordained work for you. But if you allow a carnal mind or a covetous attitude or, or, or popular opinion to the truth, you may end up locked in a job oblivious to your work. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, remember God? Remember him, don't you? When we meet him in Genesis chapter 1, we meet him working. He's the king of kings, lord of lords, but we don't see him sitting back. When we meet him, Genesis 1 and 1, what's it say? In the beginning, God was busy. In the beginning, God was doing something. In the beginning, God created. Now, 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 creation, listen, creation was the working, but he was working a work. Y'all look at me like, you sure? 
Let's prepare to receive the offering. <laughs> that was amazing. Does anybody remember being there for that? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I wrote a few things down or a few quotes down to start our conversation uh, with Bishop tonight based upon a few of the remarks that he made in his exhortation. And the first one is a quote from Johann Kepler, 17th century mathematician who said, all the sciences properly understood are thinking the thoughts of God yes. after him. Yes. All the sciences properly understood are thinking the thoughts of God yes. after him. Right. Now, we know they're both hard sciences and soft sciences. And in the mind of the 17th century scientists, Anything that was a science was something that could be discovered as a pattern. So when you discover patterns, patterns point us to intelligence. And for the believer, those who have, as Bishop referenced earlier, a kingdom of God worldview, then we understand that intelligence comes from God. The second quote was Abraham Kuyper. This one it's always disruptive every time I read it. Absolutely. Of all the creation of this vast world, there isn't one square inch that Jesus doesn't scream, this is mine. <laughs> of the entire vast creation, there isn't one square inch where Jesus doesn't scream, this is mine, this belongs to me. Yes. So when we think about kingdom of the arts and media, for too long we've allowed much more than an inch to be seen as the devil's territory. The devil's territory. Because arts and media has such a profound influence upon worldview, the enemy loved that we took a big step back yes, yes. and allow the secular and the profane to control the conversation around what we see, which in turn affects how we think, which goes back to what Bishop Blue said earlier, how we see reality. And the third one, Abraham Lincoln. The philosophy of the classroom in one generation will become the philosophy of government in the next generation. Or we can translate it using Bishop Blue's phrase, the worldview of the classroom in one generation will become the worldview of government in the next generation. And by government, let's sort of demystify that and just use a term that may be a little more palatable so that we're not automatically thinking about Democrat or Republican, red or blue. What we're talking about is administration. The essence of government is to administrate, to plan, to organize ideas, and then implement them into the legal fabric of society. So the philosophy of the classroom in one generation becomes the philosophy of government in the next. So to Bishop Blue's point about young adults, millennial, come down, Gen Z, Gen, uh, Gen Y, et cetera, what do we find? We find there's a, a what? A different what? Philosophy. But that philosophy didn't just happen because of a generation. And I'm gonna speak to parents for a moment and I'm gonna move over to a few questions for Bishop. In far too many instances, I'm not speaking about you particularly or me, we're just speaking in general, that we handed over a worldview to our children and didn't monitor what we handed them over to. And I heard a guy in media in a meeting, uh, this corporate meeting said about a month and a half ago, he said it's not so much about what our kids have access to as much as it is who has access to our kids.
So when we think about the rising tide of, of gender dysphoria or the rising tide of mental health issues and the rising tide of, of identity crisis, much of this has been downloaded legally through a tablet that our kids and grandkids were handed over. That they, did, they didn't even know what that perspective was until somebody what downloaded it. So to that point or to those points, we come around to the statement that Bishop referenced earlier that we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we see it. Which means the believer is in a constant, righteous and joyful process. Listen to me very carefully of cleansing the lens and and adjusting our filter so that we can see the world properly, see our involvement in the world properly, and ultimately see the kingdom of God manifest in a more powerful way. Now, that can sound sophisticated, but very practically it means don't be hearers of the word. But what? But doers of the word. Because the Bible says we can, what, if we're not diligent in so doing, we can be like a man looking at his face in a mirror and then leave and what, forget what manner of man he was. But he that looketh into the perfect law of liberty. That means that word looketh means to what? To gaze in. Or as we have heard before, to meditate upon the word of God day and night. That we might be like a tree planted by rivers of water that will bring forth our fruit, what, in season. So if the kingdom of God is reality as God has prescribed it, and the corresponding idea, ideology as God describes it. Bishop, here's the question that I want to I uh, pose to you. If the kingdom of God is reality as God prescribed it, and the corresponding ideology as God describes it. How do we take the words reality and ideology and make them palatable for the typical person who doesn't study? Like those words may sound philosophical. They may sound, you know, too grand, too et cetera, because those aren't words that most people commonly use, right? So how do we take this profound perspective and then using the power of language, simplify it in a way to where Jesus said, suffer little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. So that means children have a, the ability to what? Grasp the foundation of the kingdom of God. So Bishop, how do we take that thought, that perspective, and communicate it in such a way that it doesn't matter what degree of education a person has, that they can grasp it and begin to wrap their mind around it and hold it um, and not let it go. What are your thoughts about that? I think that it's, uh, uh, media help us please, uh, if you can. I think that it, um, it begins with, with children. It, it begins May I give this illustration, and I may have to get up and move around until we stop feeding. I think that if we just take some of the, the high out, we should be all right and retain volume. Should be. Uh, let, let me uh, mention that uh, th there's an outline that we have here. It'll be available in, um, there's a folder that we have. There's a voluntary kind of registration, you do not have to register. You can listen and take notes and be satisfied. But if you'd like to take this with you, along with a few other items, there will be a, a voluntary kind of registration piece that'll have much, much, much more of this than what we can say as we sit or stand or whatever. Um, so avail yourself because we'll make reference to some of these things and, and many of them we won't. It is stated, it is said, it is studied that most people who get saved, most people who have become Christians, 
became born again at age 14 or younger. In other words, the data shows that most people who are followers of Jesus Christ or who ever become followers of Jesus Christ, most of them become followers of Jesus Christ in the very early teens or in their childhood. That means that statistically, statistically, the likelihood of a child who doesn't know the Lord coming to know the Lord after childhood is narrow and slim. Or in other words, if I have not made positive influence on that child while he is a child, the likelihood becomes much, much greater that I won't be able to impact him when he gets older. Please listen to me. If it's too chilly, we'll, we'll warm you up. If it's too warm, we'll cool you down. Um, I don't want us to go all the way from some way, somehow, and we're awake to this moment we're asleep. Don't, don't do that now. In other words, like I said, you don't have to say amen, but if you have to say amen to stay awake, go ahead and say amen. That's right. When I said that, what I meant was, you know, those of you that are taking your graduate courses and postgraduate courses, you're not in there saying, hey, hallelujah, you, but, but you're wide awake. You, 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 you engage. Okay, so I, I'm just giving you the liberty because we're, we're, we're talking. Again, this is not made up blueism. I'm telling you, you can study it. You go to Barner and some of the others, and they have shown that the preponderance of people who got saved got saved as children are very early teens. All right, if that's the case, then I as a pastor, and more importantly, or equally as importantly, I as a kingdom leader, need to think what kind of strategy or structure am I moving toward or working in to touch that child at his or her most teachable phase of life and stage of life. Um, I was just talking to a pastor last evening about the fact that we are going to go back and I don't even want to say go back because we're actually not going back. We're going to go forward into some youth studies, you know, Kingdom Institute. By the way, I didn't state it, but if there are children, maybe the maybe they told you when you came in, but there, there is a children's activity prepared tonight. Um, and, and they are, as I speak, engaged. So if you have any children, we're talking about um, primary and maybe intermediate age. Um, the ushers will assist you. Um, I didn't have it written down and we got caught up. But, they, but we are prepared for them. We are prepared for them. Now, um, what, we're, what I'm meditating on is when we begin to do what can be called Sunday school, we, our version of it is Kingdom Institute. What I'm thinking about is how can I ensure that the same level of understanding that we're trying to obtain in this setting, that they're obtaining as well, okay? I, I want to know how can I ensure that those young people are being given the opportunity to be saved, to be filled with God's spirit, to learn the word of God, because God doesn't have a junior Holy Ghost. They need the same Holy Ghost. They need the same power of God, now more than ever. Now more than ever. They need to know how to pray, all of that. And so one of my great concerns is not the children when I release them. It's the adults to whom I release them. I want to be sure that they're not Kool-Aid and cookie-minded. Kool-Aid cookie crayon-minded with regard to youth ministry or children's ministry, okay? Not that we won't use cookies, crayons, and, and, crayon and, 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 and uh, Kool-Aid. That's not the point. The point is, though, those things are supposed to be a means to an end. And so, so when you ask the question, how do we make reality and ideology, how do we make those things a, a palatable and accessible? We can take the suffix of reality and just say real. J 
Jesus is real. And Jesus' view of the world, what Jesus says about the world is real. So Jesus is real. And what Jesus says about the world is real. What we experience on Sunday is real. And it'll work Monday through Saturday. That's what we're trying to say. What your pastor, your preacher, your Sunday school teacher, your whoever, what they're giving you, your, your, your youth leader, youth pastor, youth, what they're giving you whenever you all meet, Wednesday, Tuesday, online, in person, what they're giving you is coming from God who is real. He's your maker. He's your creator. And what he says about the world is the real truth about the real world. What happens a lot of times, and I'll close with this, uh, sir, what happens a lot of times with adults and children is that we operate, now I want you to listen to me very carefully, please, and ask the Lord to help us to repent. We operate in one reality in this building or whatever your building is and another reality outside this building. There are people who would not be caught dead cussing in this building but they cuss customarily outside this building. They, they would be incensed and outraged if Tasha, uh, uh, Sister Tasha, media chair, if she put a rated R, a rated NP, whatever that, 17, uh, 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 or X, or uh, triple X, uh, uh, she'd be out, they'd be out if she put profanity up on these screens, but they listen and watch those things regularly in their own space. One of those isn't real. One of those isn't real. Because if it's unfit, if it's unholy, in this context, why isn't it unholy in every context? I'm not talking about that which is natural. I'm talking about that which is vile. Don't be cussing at God, Chuck. No, no, don't be cussing. Why are you looking at that nasty movie in God? How? No, no, why are you looking at the nasty movie? Don't lie in the church. Why are you lying? It's because one of them is not real. And in as much as you spend more time out of here than in here, I have to infer that this is not real. And that's one of the ways we've lost children. That's one of the ways we've lost children. Because they watch us here and there. And they get more of us there than they get here. And if what they get there does not align with what they get here, in many instances, when they get old enough, they discard the whole thing. Here, that is. If my children don't think I'm saved, I'm not. If my children don't think I believe this, I don't. And so... Bishop, the simplicity of it is simply, it's real. We believe, we believe, for example, you know, one of the points that, 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 I, that I make in the, in the outline, the cover sheets are pages one and two. The other is, is a um, recapitulation and a representation of a, a very thorough outline that I did in 2014. But um, the, first, the first element of building worldview is doctrinal acuity. That is doctrinal, doctrinal clarity, doctrinal accuracy. The word doctrine can sound like a big bad word, but a doctrine is an idea that is taught. That's all it is. A doctrine, the root doc means to teach. And so a doctrine is an idea or a set of ideas that is believed, um, that is taught rather, and of course you choose to believe it, then you know, you're embracing the doctrine. The Bible uses two terms that are interesting. Sound doctrine. Second Timothy chapter 4. For the time will come when they will not endure. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's another expression in 1 Timothy. Uh, I believe it's chapter, four, chapter 3. Now the, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, perilous time uh, shall come. That's not the one. Uh, now the, the, that, that, that uh, give, me, give me 1 Timothy. Because a perilous time, that's, that's Bible, but that's not the passage I want. Perilous time, I believe that's 2 Timothy as well. I need, uh, I need chapter uh, 3, I believe it is. It's either 3 or 4 of uh, 1 uh, Timothy. Yeah, 4. Now the Spirit speaketh in the uh, expression that a latter time some shall depart from the faith. That's it. Giving heed, there it is, to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in 2 Timothy, we've got sound doctrine. 1 Timothy, we've got doctrines of devils. Say it another way. In Timothy, we've got healthy ideas that are to be believed. In 1 Timothy, we've got ideas that have been spawned by demons, by evil spirits. All right. As you think about the ideas in the music, the ideas in full media, whether it's movies or so forth, the ideas in politics, the ideas that are surrounding us, Where are those ideas coming from? Are they healthy, whole, sound ideas like that sound I, God, spoke of earlier? Or is it a demonically inspired idea? Listen to me carefully, and, and uh, I'll, I'll yield to Bishop again with this, with this, friends. The Bible tells us the devil gives ideas. The devil traffics in ideas. There are doctrines of devils. A doctrine is an idea that is taught. That's what a doctrine is. So that means that what Oprah espouses, what Dr. Phil espouses, what the Democratic platform espouses, what the Republican platform espouses, these are doctrines. Doctrine is not just somebody with a robe and all that kind of thing. Any, Beyonce has a doctrine. Jeff Bezos has a doctrine. Uh, all of these great movers and shakers and makers and shapers of culture, they are all coming with doctrines. Facebook has a doctrine. YouTube has a doctrine. TikTok has a doctrine. There's an ideology. It's not just, see, that's why kingdom of God is the reality and the corresponding ideology. Every reality is predicated upon an ideology. Many times we are consumers of the reality without being discerners of the ideology. May I say it again? We enjoy the product without knowing the agenda of the producer. Okay, so brother, why you have to say it like that? Um, you know, I mean, these things, we need these things. We absolutely, absolutely. But, but um, why is it that the purveyors, the, the producers, the developers of many of these things, why are they so overtly, in many instances, maybe most instances, anti-God, anti-Christ? If they are ideologies that they speak forth, if they're anti-God, anti-Christ, then how can you infer that their agenda for producing what they produce is not an anti-God, anti-Christ agenda? Everybody has an agenda. Did you hear what I said? Everybody has a motive behind what's obvious. Including what's obvious. <laughs> and at some point, particularly in our day, people have decided that they're not going to be surreptitious and subtle about it. They're going to be flagrant in your face about their agenda. So when they tell you, believe them. When they tell you, I am after perverting the minds of your children, believe them. 
When they tell you, I want to exterminate the name of God and the mention of God in the public square, believe them. That's not just rhetoric. They mean that. They're, they're doctors of demons. And, and, and so I, I don't want to, to say anything that would make us feel depressed, but I want you to be serious about the fact that Bishop made the, he made the statement. And for, for, for many of us, this is review. It needs to be reviewed. You review it so you can renew it. Faith doesn't come by having heard. It comes by hearing. Right? The, the suffix ing makes a, a verb present participle, present ongoing action. All right, so, 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 so it's necessary for us to revisit uh, these things. But, but you mentioned uh, earlier something that you were saying that, that, that brought me to this. Um, you, well, you told us, or you mentioned to us, how do we simplify ideology and reality? And I'm talking about the fact that there are ideas that are being spawned by demons. One of the, gra one of the great needs in our day for the body of Christ and for our young and for our old is discernment. 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 I don't mean the gift of discerning of spirits because God gives that to a select few. Not gift of discerning of spirits. Discernment. That's, that is... That is a, an outworking of the indwelling anointing that every believer has. Every believer, through the outworking of the anointing and the light of the word of God, every believer has a measure of discernment and can cultivate an even deeper measure of discernment. To, to know that you are living with an, you are being driven by an ideology. You are being driven by an ideology. Right is right and wrong is wrong. True enough. But in our lives, right is what we have determined to be right. And wrong is what we have determined to be wrong. So what we've determined to be right may or may not be right. What we've determined to be wrong may, um, but, but, but I gave, I, I was thinking about this um, just, just a, a, a little while ago. Um, I've seen loyalty in the church. And I've seen loyalty outside the church. I've seen loyalty to the church. And I've seen loyalty to organizations outside the church. And I have watched loyalty to organizations outside the church be at this level. Without apology. And loyalty in the church be at this level. See, that's not wrong is wrong, right is right. That is what you consider to be wrong is wrong and what you consider to be right is right because the same person who cannot sit through a 50-minute or hour-long sermon, that same person, that same person can sit through whatever that particular organization or entity is producing. The same people who can never wear sisters white communion, black communion, can wear whatever color the organization say from the crown of day head to the sole of day feet. It is because you are being driven by an ideology. I don't mean a bit of harm, but what I'm saying is if we don't have discernment, we don't see the hypocrisy in our own lives. We can't handle, uh, again, an, an hour long, hour 15, whatever it is, minute long of the sermon, can't, can't handle that. But a three hour movie. Don't want to go to the bathroom. Lord. When you have the movies, you can't, you can't pause it. You understand? 
Is the intermission in this thing or something? We are being driven by an ideology. Right is right mm -mm. in your life. Right is what you have determined to be right. And in your life, it is right to watch a three-hour movie with no break, but to not be able to handle a 50-minute to an hour-long sermon from the Word of God. I'm not fussing at you. I'm talking about we don't see ourselves. We don't see ourselves, but let trouble hit. Let a crisis arise. Let there be something that the doctor has given a bad report. And the same one who was so preoccupied, all of a sudden now, was glad when they said unto me. I'm only using that to try to give clarity to the fact that we are being driven by ideology. When the world starts wearing long dresses, it's easy for the saints, sisters, to wear long dresses. When the world brings them all the way up, it's hard for the saints to find a long dress. I'm not concerned about your clothes. I mean, you know what I mean? My wife, uh, you know, but I'm not concerned about your clothes. I'm trying to make an illustration. I'm talking about the fact that we're driven by ideology. Not cloth, ideology. So, so I, yeah, brother, brother, but you made the point right there. See, when the world does it, you can find it everywhere. When the world doesn't do it, you can't find it everywhere. Yeah, but when you determine to maintain your caliber and character, when you are determined to maintain a certain standard in terms of how you conduct yourself, you'll find it if you have to have it custom made. The point is not about your clothes. Clothes don't take people to heaven or hell. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that we are driven by ideologists, and I've given a few practical illustrations. It works on a much deeper level. When you get married, okay, okay, all right. What, what, what's the next question? Go, go to the next question. Yeah, well, you, you didn't just marry a cute girl. You didn't just marry a handsome man. You married their ideas. And Bishop, that, that, that actually brings us to our next point. What Wonderful. You just said. Wonderful. It brings us, I mean, directly to the point of... Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. <laughs> so we're going to just, we're going to caveat it and come right back around to that because the kingdom of God, what you have identified is both the king's influence and the king's affluence. And influence is about ideas, and affluence, of course, is wealth, ability, resources, assets, etc. So to that same point, certainly if you want to continue on that, you can. Uh, but in the context of why the term influence or influencer is one of the most popular phrases used in a social media context, nodes, connection points, uh, networks, influence, generating followership, creating subscriptions, creating programs, creating uh, media campaigns, etc. because the goal is to monetize a group by shaping their ideas toward a particular thing. And that's on the, the righteous, revelatory, and it's also on the, the profane as well. So, Bishop, my, my question is, one, should believers be influencers from a kingdom of God standpoint? How, do we, how should we see that? And then if you could connect it to one of our most favorite conversations, which is understanding the differences between sacred, secular, and profane. Because what we see happening, we see there's a lack of understanding of what is sacred, what is secular, and then what is profane. 
So typically what the church doesn't understand, we automatically call it what? Profane or secular. And what it really means is in many cases, not all, is that we don't understand how it fits within the idea that we previously had about God. So the best way to get rid of it is just to call it what? Secular or profane so that way we don't have to touch it. So if you could, if you could just, just talk around that wheelhouse as it relates to influencers because you were, you were leaning in heavily on the concept of ideas, which is uh, predominantly what the influencer culture and the monetization is about. But then at your own discretion, connect that to the, the ideas of secular, sacred, and profane. I reminded that Dr. Monroe stated that, and he may not be the only one, but he's certainly prevalent in our lives that, uh, 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 and, and influential in our lives, that the most powerful thing in, in the world, he said, is an idea. And, and I say in the, in the cosmos is idea because in the beginning was the idea. John 1 and 1 says in the beginning was the logos. We get from that word a number of things, but uh, logic is one of them. In the beginning was the idea. Before the beginning, the idea already existed. Nothing would exist had there not been a pre-existing idea. And the idea was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so the idea is the most important or the most powerful thing in the cosmos because the idea is Christ. He is, he is the word. To be an influencer is to take some idea and by whatever means that one has, hold that idea up to the extent that others begin to believe as you believe, engage as you engage. Again, what is a doctrine? It is an idea that is taught, right? It's an idea that is taught. And the teaching goes about or comes about many different ways. Look at Colossians 3.16 again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, teaching, indoctrinating. Hello? indoctrinating and warning one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So in other words, music, i.e. the arts, teach. They don't just entertain. They teach. They indoctrinate. They, they prescribe, as we use the term, we'll come back perhaps, they prescribe and describe reality to us. The reason why, uh, I don't remember the original singer. I can hear his voice, but I don't remember his name right now. But Because Michael uh, Bolton recorded it again, but, but it was a, an African-American recorded the first time. He, he, he recorded a song that said, When a man loves a woman. <laughs> Percy Sledge, okay? I hope you're right, because I'm not sure. So if you're all right. Oh, that's, that's Pastor. I'm sure he's right. Okay. But uh, he said, like, with, uh, assertively. Listen. And one of the reasons why that song was such a hit is because the men who loved women heard their heart being described, heard their situation being described. That actually, believe it or not, is the ministry of the psalmist. It is the ministry of the psalmist. The reason why we love the 23rd Psalm and the 27th Psalm and the 30th Psalm and certain ones that deal with things like our troubles and our valleys and all that is because we've all had them. And when we read, yea, though I walk through the valley." When we ourselves are going through a valley, the psalm becomes descriptive to us concerning our situation. On the other hand, when the psalm says, um, in my distress, I cried to the Lord. Oh, I'm in distress. The psalmist said, what I need to do is cry to the Lord. Now the psalm is prescriptive. It's my prescription. It's my instruction. It's, this is how you deal with it. I'm telling you that the when a man loves a woman is descriptive if you love one and maybe she's doing you wrong or, or maybe she's doing you well. 
But then on the other hand, maybe you don't have a girlfriend. But you remember that song. And, and one day when you get connected to one, you remember Reverend Percy. Do you understand? And really, those, those men and those women who sing those songs, they are operating in the psalmist ministry without the psalmist anointing. Unless they're born again. And if they're born again, then in some cases, they're using what God gave them for the advancement of the gospel for their own personal aggrandizement and gratification. That leads me to another place that I wasn't going, but I'll go because, I, because I, I, we won't have time to do it so much. Kingdom of the Arts is also the title of, of a writing that, that I've, I've worked on for, for some years now and then didn't work on for some years. One of the emphases in that, that writing, that book, that volume, is that is the acknowledgement that Nebuchadnezzar in the scripture is a type of Satan. He represents Satan. Yeah. Not, not in every case, but much of it. Yeah. Anybody who's going to throw you in a fiery furnace because you won't bow to their image, yeah. you understand that's the devil, right? Yeah. So Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the devil or at least of Antichrist. Yeah. Antichrist is going to have an image, the Bible says in the last days. Remember that? Okay, so, so, so uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, representing uh, Satan, he says, he said, well, two things. First, he said, bow to this image. This image is like me. This image represents me. Bow to this image. Bow to this image. Perspective. Bow to this image in nation. Remember, he told us in 2 Corinthians 10 that there were certain ones of those image in nations we need to cast down. Nebuchadnezzar said, Bow to this image. Okay? Um, you know, I was talking about the ladies a little while ago. Uh, the brothers with their, their pants down. Wait a minute. Wait, hold on. Hold on. The cloth is not the problem. There's an inner image. You follow what I'm saying there? And in wearing what I'm wearing, I'm bowing to an image. In living like I'm living, I'm bowing to an image. In viewing women as commodities, I'm bowing to an image. Women handling themselves cheaply, bowing to, and you didn't get that from nowhere. Somebody put some images in front of you and you bow. So Nebuchadnezzar becomes a Satan, Antichrist figure. But notice this, notice this. I, I'm, I'm talking, but there's 101 different ways that I could go. So please, pr pray for me, just pray for me. Notice that the bowing, and see, it's not about the pants shirt. It's not about the, the, the sag any more than it's about the short uh, skirts with the lady. That, that's not the point. The point is metacognition, thinking about your thinking. That, that, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. Do we realize that we are being driven by something? It's not arbitrary. It didn't just happen. It didn't just pop up. I, I used to ask my students when they would wear their, their hair nappy. After, you know, there was a, a phase where they wore the do-rag and, and everything was wavy. And then they went from wavy to nappy. And I asked them, why, why do you wear nappy like that? I said, well, I just like it like that. Well, why is it that you didn't like it like that until an image told you that you like it like that? Because for then, you liked it the other way. But the image, the influencers told you what you liked. I'm using very elementary illustrations, but it's far more sophisticated. Got it? But notice this. Notice this, uh, Brother Emmanuel. Notice that when it was time to bow to the image, he didn't just say, one, two, three, bow. He said, no, when you hear the music. So the music. 
is conducive to my bowing to certain images. That's why this is kingdom of the arts. Because you can operate in the psalmist gift while not operating in the psalmist anointing. And the psalmist both describes and prescribes to the hearer. That's what makes their songs timeless. A man or woman who truly has the psalmist call upon his or her life, their songs, their music does not go out of style. Their voice is always fresh. I don't care how many times you hear Michael Jackson, his voice is always fresh. I don't care how many times you hear Aretha, her voice is always fresh. Now let's go back to Nebuchadnezzar for just a moment. The Bible says that when Nebuchadnezzar overran Judah, the scripture says that he went into the temple and took out the vessels of God. I need you to understand that when it comes to gifts such as the one I just described, many of those people were vessels in the temple of God. And Nebuchadnezzar stole them out of God's house. Motown, and, 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 and I'm, I thank God for Motown. I have great regard historically and culturally for Motown. But Motown was populated by the choir. The soloist. Come on, Sam Cook. You follow what I'm saying? Nebuchadnezzar stole them out of the temple. And Nebuchadnezzar has more than one technique. What Nebuchadnezzar is doing now is having them think that they can operate in the temple and in the club. I don't mean any harm. I'm not, listen, please, don't, don't tell them real. I'm not in a tell them real. I'm talking about discernment. I'm talking about the fact that many of our young men and women and some of our old ones don't have a discernment with regard to the distinction between sacred and secular, which is not nearly the distinction that we try to make it, but between sacred and profane which are antithetical. We missed it when we equated secular to sinful. And yet I just told you that these people have psalmist gifts. And when one has a gift and that gift is profound, at some point, one stops carrying the gift and the gift begins to carry him or her. I'm driven to get this thing out of me. But you tell me there's no place for it in the temple. I'm, 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 I'm driven to this expression. I'm just, but you tell me there's no place for this in the liturgy. You tell me that's the devil. But I've never served the devil. I mean, I, I don't love the devil. I love Jesus. I, I, I've never... In many instances, we put out what God intended to retain. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13 and the corresponding places in the other two synoptics that when Logos is sown into a person's heart, but they don't understand it, the devil steals it. Those Low guy, if, if I may use that, those, those ideas of God, those gifts of God were sown into the lives of many of those people. They didn't understand it, and the people that were their mentors and guides didn't understand it, and so Satan stole it. I can tell you about basketball players who didn't make it, but they did not not make it because they didn't try out. They didn't make it because the preacher told them that you can't play basketball and serve God. You can't play football and serve God. And so God was the one who put it in them and the preacher tried to take it out. God 
put it in them and religion took it out or tried to take it out. And here's the thing. At some point when that fire is, 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 is so uh, 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 profound, so indomitable, when that passion is virtually irresistible, then the person comes to the place where they have to make a decision. Either I have to stay here with y'all and suffocate this thing that's operating in me. Or I'm going to have to find somebody who will give me the liberty to express what's within me. Uh, and in many instances, it would have been safer for your soul to stay here. God Almighty. But it was safer for your gifting It is sad when there is an environment that is more conducive to your development outside the house of God than in. Many of the people who claim they hate God right now, they don't hate God. They hate what the ignorant church, not the whole church, but the ignorant church did to them. And I'm going to tell you that part of my calling and part of our calling in this hour is to go after some Caleb's. The Lord gave me a little word here today. I was trying to pull it up. Oh boy. Lord have mercy. Tell somebody to go after Caleb. Go after Caleb. Who is Caleb? Caleb is that gentleman who is 45 years behind through no fault of his own. 45 years behind because of the saints. Forty-five years behind, and he didn't cause it. What? What is an individual with NBA competency supposed to do at eighty-five? What? What? What is a person who always had a passion for law supposed to do now at seventy? When? Because of the saints, he muzzled that because Jesus said, woe to the lawyers. I remember there was a Bible study that was being held in my house. And the bishop, the bishop told me, they asked him, what you want to do when you grow up? What you want to become when you get out of school? And I said, whatever I said. I said, well, that's fine, but don't be a lawyer. Because the Bible said, woe to you doctors and lawyers. He told me that, and listen, and you can find some scripture that, that says something like that. Excuse me, that states something like that. But if that had been my calling, basically he's asking me to commit suicide on the vision, on the, on the gifting, on the... So if, if I end up in the hands of an atheist who doesn't believe in my God, but does believe in my gift... Do you understand how I might turn out if not a total atheist, at least an agnostic? And the whole point of talking about this gift thing is both we're in kingdom of the arts and media. Every good gift, James 1.17, and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And Gospel of John chapter 1 around verse 7 or 8 says he lighteth every man. Not every saved man, every man that cometh into the world. That's why I said they have a psalmist gift. I don't mean that they're anointed. I mean, unless they've been saved, but I mean that they've got the natural underpinning and capacity that's supposed to hold a psalmist anointing. 
But even without the psalmist anointing, the psalmist's gift will work to a great, and the devil will see to it that it works to an exaggerated measure so that they feel as if they're being successful. But the truth be told, that good gift will never become a perfect gift until they put it back in the hand of the one who gave it to them. That's the thing. That's the thing. We need to be able to say to that young man, that young woman, what you got is good. That talent that you have, that passion that you have, all of that is good. But it will not be perfected. It will not be matured. It will not become all that it's supposed to become until you subject it to the one who gave it to you from the beginning. You've heard me say it before, some of you, and I'll say it again. It's called the law of the second touch. Ladies and gentlemen, the two fish and the five loaves, when they were put in the hands of Jesus, that was not the first time they'd been in his hand. It was not the first time that this, this fish and this bread had been in proximity to Jesus. Because in the beginning, Jesus created the heaven and the earth. Hallelujah! All things consist in him. And so this bread recognizes that before I was bread, when I was just barley growing in the field, my God, it was Jesus that put me in the field. That fish said, while I was still swimming in the Sea of Galilee, it was Jesus that gave me the ability to breathe underwater through my gills. I recognize these hands. Praise the Lord. But when that lad gave that gift to the apostle, and oh, mm, you know there does come a time when you need to put your gift in the hand of an apostle. All right, okay. Take, because you're a self-made man a self-made woman you don't think you need anybody to help you but the Bible says they didn't he, that lad did not give his gift to Jesus he gave his gift into the hand of an apostle God will raise somebody up who you can trust to submit that gift and they're not going to exploit you they're going to take what you gave them and give it to him loose him and bring him to me Palm Sunday where are you and so, and so, when this bread and this fish end up back in Jesus' hand, I would shout a little bit, but you know I'm not going to do it. Say, back in his hand. When this fish and this bread end up back in his hand, what was just enough for one lad became more than enough for a multitude. The law of the second touch is if you take the good gift and put it back in his hand, what was merely a good gift now becomes a perfect gift. And what was inadequate or barely sufficient now becomes more than enough. If you take that psalmist gift that God has placed in you and put that back in God's hand, here's what will happen. You will be fruitful. You will multiply. You will replenish the But um, if there's not an environment conducive, our local churches are not personality cults. God did not raise this ministry up because I needed somewhere to preach. God does not raise up sheep to validate a shepherd. God raises up shepherds to fulfill the necessity of the sheep. And my primary and your pastor's primary and your apostle, prophet, evangelist, and teacher's primary responsibility is to lead or to assist you as you are led by the Spirit on a path of discovery as to why God put you in the earth to start with. That's my responsibility. It's not necessarily to go with you fishing. It's not necessarily to go with you out back out front. All those things are good in their place. But my primary responsibility is to help escort you on a course of discovery. When you realize that you are a who, you need somebody to tell you why. That, 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 that's my responsibility. Help you find out why God made you a who. Are you listening? And, and, and so, what kind of ideology governs this house? What kind of ideology governs your house? What ideology? The light of the body is the eye. If the eye be 
single, if the eye is healthy, if there's a healthy perspective. Does, does, does this local church have a healthy perspective of God? A healthy perspective of people? Some of you have been with me preaching who's on your altar. Eli did not have a healthy perspective of Hannah. He did not see who she was. In many instances, you got to have a title for folk to see who you are. You got to wear the right kind of clothes for people to see who you are. You got to belong to the right kind of family for people to see who you are. But when your eye is healthy, when your perspective is sound, you can look in the trash and see the treasure. When your eyes are healthy, you can look at Hannah doing an unconventional thing on the altar and you won't scorn her, but you'll realize that she's carrying more than meets the eye. Lord, I bless your holy name. Thank you. And there's some Hannahs that have been kicked off the altar mm -hmm, when they should have been embraced on the altar. Hannah wasn't praying like everybody else prays. Hannah wasn't operating like everybody else operated. But she was at a place of desperation because she had a sense of purpose that was not being fulfilled. I'm supposed to be doing something that I'm not doing. I'm supposed to become something I haven't become. And I thought if I came to the altar, somebody would show me how to bring out of me what I believe God had put in me. perspective if your perspective is healthy your whole life will be full of light it says but if your eye be evil that means that evil no no don't think like evil Ooh, mean no no if your eye is sick if your eye is unhealthy your whole body will be full of darkness. When your perspective is an unhealthy, that, that, that's one of the things, really, one of the things, the pastor, that I grieve about the most. It's when I see saints of God with unhealthy eyes. When they can't see good in one another. When they can't see potential in one another. Jeez. When they always expect the worst. God, it grieves me because the Bible said that if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Everything is dark. Everybody dirty. Everybody crooked. Nobody can be trusted. Nobody really wants to be saved. Everybody's a hypocrite. No, babe, it's you and your dirty glasses and your messed up eyes. Jesus. And the Bible says that as a result of that perverse perspective, your whole life is full of darkness. Your whole life is full of darkness. Your lifestyle is a dark lifestyle. You're twisted, and everything that you have the opportunity to influence, you twist. And they're just as skeptical as you are. And they're backbiters just like you. And they're fault finders, nitpickers, and critics just like you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And this is the worst part of that Matthew 6 that I'm quoting here. He says, and if the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness? When you come to the place like Isaiah said, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Boo, you've had a dark day. And you're living a dark life. Can the church say amen? Uh, Bishop, let, let, let's get just a little bit further and then we're going to, to, to have to close. Um, uh, let, let me say this though, Bishop. The, the, the point that I was trying to make or about to make when I mentioned doctrinal acuity is that the first step in proper perspective is that I really need a strong grasp on what saith the scripture. See how well that went over. I need a biblical grasp if I believe there is a God okay and we can you can believe God empirically before you believe in God experientially and personally you can believe that there is a God 
without believing in that God. Science tells us, follow the science they told us during the pandemic, right? And prior. Science tells us that the universe had a beginning. Science tells us that even those who believe in the multiverse, logically, it had a beginning. Those who believe in the Big Bang, they will tell you that at the point of the Big Bang, there was a singularity that exploded and began to hurl outward. And this massive energy and power as these things go out, as they radiate outward, they're losing energy, they're losing momentum. And so if they're losing energy and momentum, it suggests that there was a time when they had more of it. If they have determined that the scientifically, that the universe had a beginning, had a cause, listen to me, logically, there cannot be an infinite set of causes so in other words, all right, there's the Big Bang. Something caused it, okay? Now, what caused, what caused the Big Bang, okay? What caused, what caused the Big Bang? What caused, what caused, what caused the, you understand? Keep going further and further. Ma, grandma, great grandma, you follow that? You cannot have an infinite set of recessive causes. Recessive going back process of going forward. You cannot have it because logically if it's infinitely going backward where does it start? It's got to start somewhere. There has to be some ignition. There has to be you find some initiation. Or in other words, yes, logically, Aristotle said it 2,000 or more years ago that there has to be a prime mover. There has to be an uncaused cause. Well, what did the cause cause? He caused matter, he caused space, time, and he caused energy. So whatever it is that caused this stuff has to be able to exist without this stuff. If he caused matter, he must be immaterial. If he caused space, time, he must be spaceless and timeless. If he caused energy, he must be all-powerful without the need for natural energy. And the fact that the universe is so finely tuned, he must be intentional. He must be intelligent. And inasmuch as it, as it is fine-tuned for the sustaining of human life, it almost suggests that he has a personal interest. So now when you come forward with an immaterial, spaceless, timeless, omnipotent, infinitely omniscient and intelligent, personal cause, someone has said far more eloquently than I that that sounds remarkably similar to the profile of the God of the Bible. So you don't have to have hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. No, the science leads us. Uh, 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 the psalmist, the psalmist said it this way, Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the ferment shows forth his handiwork. God is only known by revelation. And the first level of revelation is creation. The first, revel, the first level of revelation is natural revelation, which is creation. Okay? And, and, and so teaching our children to appreciate nature, to appre that, that, that's a part of that reality ideology. All right? And, and let's go ahead and give the five. We can at least give one list. It, it's, it's on your handout. And some of you heard us go through it before. Creation is the first level of revelation. Second level is conscience. The conscience. There's something in you that, that gives you a sense of right, wrong, good, evil. There must be something up there. Conscience. The human spirit speaking to you. That's what it is. 
Thirdly, the canon, that is the written word of God. Fourthly, the Christ, the Lord Jesus, is God manifest. And then, number five, the Christian or the church is the fifth means by which God is revealed. Now, the, four, the first four, no problem. That fifth one, that's the one we got to work on to make sure that we are a representation of God and not a misrepresentation of God. Amen? Bishop, let's, let's, let's go a little bit further. Okay, we're really going. One more thing. Um, work, work with me on a parallel. Work with me on a parallel. God is only known by revelation. What did I say those five levels of revelation were? Creation, conscience, canon, Christ, and then the Christian. Either you becoming a Christian or some Christian representing Christ to us, right? Representing God to us. I want you to parallel this with God's will concerning you is known by revelation. God is known by revelation. But suppose we make the case that the real you is made known by revelation. Okay? Let's go back through the five. What are they? What's first? Creation, right? Even so, one of the ways that you know God's will for your life is how he created you, your gifts, your aptitudes. You just made this way. Nobody taught you to sing. You just started singing. Nobody taught you to draw. You just started drawing. Nobody taught you to organize things, but, but even your little dolls, you had them. You understand? So, so creation not only testifies to who God is, it testifies for God who you are. Okay? And then th that, that's enablement. We're using ease for this one. And then secondly, you're the, the, the conscience speaks of the inner, inner person. God's will is made known concerning your life by your energies. The first one is enablement. The second one is energies. What, what do you mean when you say that, brother? Your passions, your compassions, your burdens, your interests. Someone asked the question this way, what keeps you up at night? When you have your own discretionary time, what do you find yourself thinking about? What problem do you believe you were born to solve? Y'all with me? God. Okay, then thirdly, the edict, um, which would be corresponding to the canon, what's God command us to do in the scripture? Then the example, Christ again, and then edification. Christians are supposed to help other Christians become, I was talking about that just now, create an environment that's conducive to our becoming. Um, all of this is necessary for a kingdom of God. All of this is ingrained in what we mean when we say a kingdom of God perspective. So, so Bishop will give us one more question and we're going to wrap. Uh, we, we may get one or two questions, but we're going to begin to wrap it uh, after that. Sir, uh, your, your question, comment, what have you. Yes, sir. Praise God. There's grace for difficulty. One of the things I just wrote down, Bishop, was as it relates to how we act on ideology and reality, how we act on it, how we engage it, how we participate in it. And one of the illustrations that I wrote down was a fish in water doesn't realize it's in water. You have to remove the fish from the water before it realizes that it's not in the water because the water is so pervasive to the fish's biological existence, it's not until you move it out of that environment before it realizes that something was so pervasive or ubiquitous that it was actually sustaining the fish. Yeah, yeah. And I had that thought in regard to worldview and in regard to perspective. And you mentioned about metacognition and thinking about our thinking self-awareness, highest form of awareness, of course, awareness of God, number one, and then awareness of self, number two. From an action standpoint or implementation, shrinking a gap between being a hearer and what? A doer. Sometimes God has to allow pain to happen to help us see 
what those influences are that have been navigating our life the whole time. Now, we know that's not the will of God. We know pain is not a part of God's plan because God only has good for us. But you mentioned earlier about children and those, the ages where the majority of people are coming to faith in Christ. So there has to be something that happens at such a level of emotional intensity that it actually shocks the pattern. Because we become adults and we are what? We're fish in water. And we don't realize what influence has, has controlled or is controlling how we think. So God has to allow something to happen to disrupt the pattern. And in most cases, it's pain that does that. Some level of difficulty that cannot be solved by their gift or their intelligence or their relationships. And it puts that person in a position of looking what? Up to God. So from an action standpoint, this was the question or this was the statement that I made. And this is what we're going to the question for you, Bishop. So the statement that I made in terms of the context of the fish, we know in social, you can find anything by a hashtag. And those who are sophisticated on social, we've got certain hashtags pinned that we follow to make sure we don't really miss what's happening in that particular thread of conversation. So in church, we typically say hashtag X, but in most cases, again, please excuse me, but in most cases, we never go back and follow that hashtag. So hashtag kingdom of God, hashtag X, it's almost like just a little thing we do and then we move on. But that hashtag is curating all the conversations or all the ideas surrounding that particular idea. So what hashtag is governing our heart and our head? Like if we go back and look at the last three days, three weeks, three months, three years, and if we were to evaluate our lives as it relates to the ideas that we are embracing and acting upon, what hashtags would those ideas and actions surround? Right? Because we talk about influence, right? Being salt and light, but then someone is salting us. Amen. Lord have mercy. So someone or something is salting or assaulting, right? So, Bishop, as it relates to marriage and family, and I know that could be certainly a comprehensive <laughs> dynamic, but it seems as if relationships are under such profound attack. And one of the statements that I've made is, if we're not careful when you just look at what's trending, most people, or far too many people, will have a new best friend every three months. Because we have such, as a culture, such a low tolerance for imperfect people. Because it's so easy to find someone who is better than the last friend we had. The last husband we had. The last wife. Come on now. So the attack on relationships. The hashtags, there's a, as a matter of fact, there's a billboard up in Rock Hill, Fort Mill, going into South Charlotte, Bishop. And the billboard literally says this. It's several of them. There's an African-American female uh, on the billboard. My understanding is that she is the attorney. I mean, she, the gravitas of the picture implies this is her law firm. And, and the, the billboard says, life is short, get a divorce. We talk about ideas, real reality, and images. I mean, powerful. I mean, this is not a little small ad somewhere. Life is short. Get a divorce. Think about the power of that seed. The power of that idea 
when a husband or a wife is going through a season of difficulty. And as you referenced earlier about the songs, what comes back? What comes back? What picture comes back? I don't have to put up with this. There's somebody else better for me. So, Bishop, how do we apply, or from your, from, from your perspective, I know we've, we talked about children, we talked about social influence, now, of course, talking about family, but how, in, in, your, in your mind and spirit, how do we apply the rule of God to the concept of marriage, and to, of concept of marriage more particularly? Because the rule isn't, 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 it isn't first a law. It's first a standard. A ruler is a standard. And you preached several years ago about the line and how a line, we know mathematically it exists, but, you, but, but it, it only exists in reality when we draw it. But mathematically it exists in the invisible. But there is no line that you can see, but the math says the line is real. Going back to irreducible complexity, which you mentioned earlier, and uh, the uncaused first cause. How do we establish a kingdom of God rulership or idea or standard in the context of family when there is such a great assault against, and I'm going to use this phrase, the longevity of relationships? How, how, do we, how do we apply that? Because many of us, you know, whether it be preachers or parishioners or whatever, we, can't, we don't have a future outside of relationships. There's no future outside of people. There is no destiny of God in our lives that is solo. There is no assignment that is alone. So whatever destiny, whatever kingdom of God unfolding that will occur in your life, people are indispensable to that assignment. What are your thoughts, Bishop, on how we apply the kingdom of God, to relationships, marriage, so that we don't miss God's rulership in that area. All of these topics and subtopics are, are so vast, and, and any one of them we can linger forever. You know that's true. We all know it's true. Um, I want to sound like I'm oversimplifying, but I want to do it because I want to get to a certain point tonight that, that we won't have to totally omit it. Um, and that is, if it is a kingdom marriage, then it is a marriage as God prescribed it. And God's prescription is found in the book of Genesis. Chapter 1, implicit. Chapter 2, explicit. And um, our perspective of marriage, our his and hers, in many instances, um, are a perspective that is not um, God's perspective. Um, God, when, when he in, initiates marriage, there are a few th things that we point out, want to point out, and then kind of spring, use that to spring into a summative statement. God says it's not good that the man should be alone. Um, that's the first clue. Besides Genesis 1, in the image of God, created him male and female, created he them. But as far as marriage, this is the first intimation that God has marriage on his mind. He says it is not good that the man be alone. This man has a relationship with God. Before marriage. He's walking with God. He's not just walking with God. He's working with God. He has discovered that journey that leads to the fulfillment of his destiny. He has a house and a job. Before the idea of a wife even arises. And God has given him, he has found his calling. He has found his vocation. He has found his work. And God says, 
it is not good that he would be alone. I will make him a help, not a help me, help me, whatever. It's one word, help. And then he describes the help, a help that is meet for him, compatible, suitable, appropriate, complementary, C-O-M-P-L-E and C-O-M-P-L-I, mentory for him. And the Bible says that God goes, goes to work. This, this woman is, God puts him to sleep. You, you know the story. God put him to sleep and, and took a side. So one of the first things that we see is that she's help. The word help that is applied to her is the same word that's applied to God. So there's nothing inferior implied. A kingdom marriage is not predicated upon the idea that women are subject or sub subservient or inferior to men. So if you have that idea in your marriage, that's not a kingdom of God marriage to that extent. Just like if you have that idea in your church, that's not a kingdom of God church. If you have it in your vocation, Anything that makes any human being inferior to another human being is an anti-God, anti-Christ idea. The Bible says that he made another man. That's what God made. The word is bana, built. He built a man. A man equipped to complement the first man. She is a wound man. She is a W-O-M-B hyphen E-D man. She is the wound man. She is the man given competencies that complement his competencies and make up for his lack of certain competencies. She is given a garden for which he has seed only. She is given a uterus to complement the scrotum that he has. She is given over to complement the sperm that he has. We stop there, however, and don't realize that what God is saying is that he has made her or ordained that the right she would be for the right he, a facilitator of his dream. Because he has seed other places than in his scrotum. And she is to be his facilitator, his incubator. He will compliment her likewise. But in the office of wife, the office of wife is a compliment to the office of husband. It is a fulfilling, it is a word. Matter of fact, the word bana is the same word from which we get the, the word bar. Bar, son, bana, build. It has to do with building out. A son is the building out of the father. Okay? He is the extension. And so before there's a son, there's a bonda who will give him a bar. There, there's, there's, a, there's a compliment that will produce his compliment and facilitate what he has in potential form and it will come into actual form. My, my, my simple point is, if we don't see women and men and husbands and wives according to the scripture, according to the prescription, then Clearly, we're not going to uh, survive the difficult times. We're going to come to the conclusion. Our view of men and of women, if we see a wife or a husband as a sex object or as a bill payer or as a cook, uh, as a convenience, then we will handle them accordingly. But that never was scripture. That never was God. That never was his perspective. Again, we're back to perspective. And so, sir, I think that the survival of our relationships is contingent upon the perspective of our relationships. There was a time when people who even weren't saved saw marriage as a lifelong commitment. What we see it as now for some of us is, is simply a, a business arrangement. Glorified roommates. 
and, and, and the whole idea of a sacred pact and vow and covenant, we lost that. It's just a piece of paper. And so the perspective is what drives us to divorce court. Not the pain, the perspective. The pain never was the problem. The pain never was the problem. Pain is not a disease. Pain is a dis-ease. But pain is not a disease. Pain is an indicator that there is a disease. Pain is a witness. Pain is an alarm system. Pain has a ministry. We run from the pain rather than get treated for the disease. And, and, and many times we hear the statement in the affirmative, there is a balm in Gilead. But that's not the way the Bible reads. The Bible said, is there no balm in Gilead? In other words, is there no healing influence left in God? You can preach, but you don't think you can heal your relationship. You can see somebody's future, but you can't see how to talk to that man or talk to that woman. Is there no balm? Is there no healing? Is there no God influence? You can save the world. You can't save your house. You travel all around the world evangelizing and won't walk across the room to touch your spouse. Perspective. Our perspective is rooted in the word of God because the word is the constitution of the, in the, in the law of the kingdom of God. Um, so, so, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, he took a rib. The word rib, the translated rib, is side. There is a feminine side of life. This whole androgynous heresy is the spawn of hell. There is a side that is distinct from masculinity or distinct from femininity. They, they, they are different. God never called them opposite, but they do complement. You follow that? Don't even use that idea. Don't even use that language, opposite sex. We're not opposed. Hello? The adjective opposite comes from the verb oppose, right? We're not opposed to one another. Stop saying that opposite sex. We're not opposite. We're complementary. We're distinct from one another, for one another. We're distinct from, for. I said we're distri distinct from one another, for the good of one another. You don't need another you. Concave needs convex. You don't need concave on concave. When we say kingdom of God, and please hear this. When we say kingdom of God, we're saying that God owns all things because God made all things. He is Lord because he's God. He is Adonai because he is Elohim. Because he made everything, he owns everything. And if he owns it, he has the right to rule it. Kingdom of God. But in his sovereignty, he ordained because he's love. He's relational. And he did not. First of all, he created because he's love and love is expressive. Creation, creativity is a love expression. And he desired to share his power, his beauty, his excellence, all of his attributes to share them with an earthly object. That is an earthly recipient, an earthly counterpart. 
Nobody had ever heard of it before until he said in 126 of Genesis, let us make something that had never been known in eternity before. Man. Make him how? In our image, after our likeness. Once the man is made, God says, and as he's being made, he says, I'm giving him dominion over the earth. I'm giving him stewardship over my ownership. I'm going to make him as man, man a jerk of all that I own. Please stay with me. This is the age of man. That means you, male or female, are man a jerk. Whether you're the wound man or whether you're the seed man, you are man a jerk. This age is in your hand. For better or worse, it's contingent upon your management. Once God made man the mediator for the earth, once God made man the high priest of the earth, his interactions with earthly and worldly matters became indirect more than direct. And the man now is the mediator and the intermediary between God and his created order. Man becomes the federal head of the earth. When man falls, when he fell, when he yielded to Satan, he relinquished not the dominion, not the management. What he relinquished was the rightful exercise. Please stay with me, friends. Stay with me. God. What he relinquished. You know, many times you hear people say that when Satan, uh, you know, when man disobeyed Satan, uh, disobeyed God and obeyed Satan, uh, Satan took the dominion. He gave the dominion to Satan. No, 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 no. He, he didn't give up the dominion. He couldn't give it up. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. If God put it in man, Satan can't take it out of man. But what he did relinquish was the rightful exercise of that dominion. And so Satan got the right to exploit man's dominion. But he still got to have a man in the equation. He can never do his will on the earth without a man to be the facilitator because the dominion on the earth still belongs to man. No murder without a man. No rape, when I say man, I mean human. No rape without man. No theft without man. No lie without man. No corruption without man because the dominion on the earth still belongs to man. God, I used to ask as a child, why don't you just start over? Seemed like it would have been easier. Just kill them or zap them or do something and just start over. God said, no, if I do that, I violate my own word. I said that this is the age of man. I can't change my own word. So since man has brought corruption into the earth, it will take a man to eradicate the earth of its corruption. Thank you, sir. And so he starts throwing hints. That's a country term. He starts throwing hints about the fact that there's a man who's going to undo what the man has done. He starts throwing hints in 315 of the book of Genesis. Throwing hints. Y'all don't know about that. He says that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. He throws hints. He tells Abraham, he said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Throwing hints. He said, God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Let's throw it in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He tells Samuel, go tell Jesse, I found me a king among your sons. Thank you, sir. He keeps throwing these hints. He talks about that uh, Bethlehem, you're going to be real important one day. He's throwing hints. Uh, somebody's going to ride on a donkey into Jerusalem on a very special day. Daniel said, if you got a good calendar, I want you to count down 79 weeks of years, four, uh, 69 weeks of years, uh, 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 490 minus 7. What's that? 482, 4, 483, 483 years from the decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Count it down. 483 years from then, there's going to be a fellow who presents himself in Jerusalem as Messiah. 
count him down. And because they won't receive him, he's going to end up being cut off. Not for himself, but for his people. God kept throwing hints. Uh, David wrote about it when he said, when he said, all right, all right, all right, all right. Well, it came to pass. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. The purpose of Jesus coming, that's one of the questions that we didn't get to. What was the main purpose that Jesus came? He came, he came, uh, what, he came to put us back where God had us from the beginning. He came to restore us to God's original intention. He came mm, to, to close the parentheses so that the sentence can be complete. Yes, he did. And, and so, so listen to what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says. I, 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 I promise you, I'm trying to wrap. I'm talking about kingdom of God. God was king. He made Adam king. That makes God king of kings. God was Lord. He made Adam Lord. That makes him Lord of lords. And so Adam is a king and a Lord and a priest. Are you hearing me? Jesus comes. Hallelujah. And Jesus is coming as the last Adam to recapture all that the first Adam forfeited. Kingdom of God. King, simple for children. All that the first Adam had lost. And so he died an ignominious death. He died a hideous death. He died a sacrificial substitutionary death. He died that because that was the price that was exacted because of humanity's sin. It was necessary for him to die. It pleased God to bruise him. It pleased God to bruise him because with every bruise, God said, I'm getting them back. I'm getting them back. With every bruise, God said, it won't be long now. It won't be long now. I'll be able to commune with them as I once did and as I desire to. And the Bible lets us know that Jesus died. He died. He died and he was buried. He was buried, but here's the thing. He rose again. He rose again. We're talking about the gospel of the kingdom of God. You are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God if you do not major in the resurrection. When you read the book of Acts, the book of Acts preaching the, the, the thing that they emphasize the most. When you read the epistles, the, the, the historical event, in the, if you notice in the book of Acts and in the epistles, they don't spend a lot of time on the virgin birth. They don't. They don't spend a lot of time on Jesus' earthly ministry. They don't. But they spend all kinds of time on that pivotal event when he died and he was buried and then he rose. Wait a minute. Not just rose, but was glorified. Hey, the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't preach about that enough. We don't meditate on that enough. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus told his father in John chapter 17, he said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. So in other words, what I was saying in my meditation earlier, oh God, I've got notes here, church, no use of me trying to use What I was saying uh, uh, to the Lord, or saying in my meditation from the Lord, uh, is that uh, uh, Jesus is not getting uh, a glory that he lost. Jesus is getting a glory that he left uh -huh, in order that man might get the glory that he lost. And uh, the reason why the epistles talk so much and the apostles talk so much about the resurrection is because the resurrection in the exaltation wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Listen, Jesus has always been God. Would you shake somebody's hand and tell him or her Jesus has already always been God so Jesus was not exalted as a benefit to himself Jesus was not exalted like oh I'm in heaven I ain't never been in heaven before Jesus was not exalted I'm on the phone I've never been on no 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 Jesus all he was doing was being restored to a glory he left but in Jesus being restored to the glory he left man is being restored to the glory he lost because later Ladies and gentlemen, uh, prior to the incarnation, God was not a man. 
but from John 1 14 going forward God is also a man now Balaam had it right in the 23rd chapter of Numbers at the 19th verse when he said God is not a man and that's absolutely so but ladies and gentlemen that was before the cross that was before the manger that was before the virgin but ladies and gentlemen now God has become a man so listen to me the reason why Peter in chapter 2 of the book of Acts says that God has exalted Jesus and in chapter 3 God has exalted Jesus and in Acts chapter 4 that God has exalted Jesus and in Acts chapter 5 that God has exalted Jesus and that all the apostles pick it up it is because for the first time in time eternal past in eternity past for the first time there's not just God sitting on God's throne but there is a man sitting on God's throne there is a man in the glory there is a man sitting angels have never sat there seraphim have never sat there cherubim have never sat there as a matter of fact and what we read in the scripture there's no record of an angel ever sitting in the presence of God either the angels stand or they bow either they stand or they bow but there's this creature that God formed of the dust of the earth there's this creature that God blew out of his own blew out of his own being into to that dust house and that creature doesn't just bow that creature doesn't just stand but that creature has been raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus wonder of wonders there's a man on God's throne there's a man on God's throne I mean somewhere beyond the sun moon and stars somewhere beyond the solar system somewhere beyond the Milky Way galaxy somewhere beyond all of that there is a man with holes in his hand and holes in his feet and holes in his side there is a man sitting on God's throne and as my pastor and other preachers have all said one of the reasons why he had a hole in his side is because it had to be a place for me and for you to get in him because you remember that the first Adam had a bride and where did she come from she came out of his side this time he doesn't have a bride coming out he's got a bride going in therefore if any man be in Christ he is, he is, he is a new creature. We have a passageway. We have an entranceway. We have an access by the Spirit unto the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise him for a moment. Let me say one more thing. Praise him right there. Jesus in the 15th chapter of First Corinthians, I believe it's the 45th verse, yet Jesus is dubbed the last Adam. And so what that means is, at last, Jesus is the last Adam. At last, be fruitful. At last, multiply. At last, replenish the earth and subdue it. At last, become what I've ordained that you would become. Jesus is our second chance. Jesus is our opportunity to become what he ordained that, that we would be from the beginning. But remember now, remember this as, 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 as I close this. Remember this. In the interim between the first Adam and the last Adam, God didn't stop being God to his people. Mm. God didn't stop giving gifts and talents and abilities to his people. He was just waiting on the opportunity for those with good gifts to bring them back so that they might be made perfect gifts. And what's the purpose of the gift? The preacher said in 2015 that the gift is for governing. The gift is that you might occupy what area of God's system that he has called you unto. There's a gift for you to go into the political arena. There's a gift for you to go into the medical arena there's a gift for you to go into retail to go into industry to go into education to go into the arts to go into the sciences there's a gift in you there's a natural gift which is a capacitator for the supernatural gift so that when you come back with the good he's able to anoint you till it becomes the perfect uh, hallelujah he didn't stop he didn't stop here's what's powerful here's what's powerful and I'm close I want to give that an illustration because this is kingdom of the arts and media this will be in the book too this will be in the book too the bible says that 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 um, uh, that, that uh, Adam the first Adam had a son and then he had another son 
the first son was named Cain. And the second son was named Abel. You remember that, don't you? And the first son, bless his dear darling heart, rose up and made a mess, didn't he? He committed the first murder, the first fratricide, the first homicide. He, he committed the first murder. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible lets us know that uh, he left um, what we might call the presence of God. He left an encounter. He left the disciplinary voice of God and built a city. You know why he built a city? Because God put cities in Adam. There were no cities in the garden. The cities were in the garden. The cities were in Adam. So even though Cain is contaminated as a murderer, he still got the gift in him. Hey, I'm gonna shy. He's still an urban developer. Are oh, you listening to me? He's still a city planner. Thank you, sir. When you read about his, 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 his descendants, you find that one of his descendants is the father of agriculture. You find another of his, of his uh, descendants is the founder of music. He, God, get, get, get your Bible. Just get your Bible. Jesus, Jesus. Y'all don't want to get your Bible, but I'll get mine for a minute. Uh, uh, it's the fourth chapter. It's the fourth chapter. The Bible says that um, uh, verse 17, and Cain knew his wife, and, and it was his sister, um, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. She wasn't a, a gorilla or any of that. She was, a, she was his sister. Where he can't get his wife from? It's his, his sister. The one you married is your sister too. Is she human? She's your sister. She may not be directly from the same human parents, but she's in the same human family. That's what I'm saying. Y'all all right? Okay, 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. He builds it and called the name of the city after the name of his son. Cain, a murderer, but a city builder. Because the gift of building cities is in him. You're not talking with me. Uh, and then as we go a little further, we find the Bible says uh, that the, the, the king of the cowboys come out of Cain. Mm, uh -huh. Then verse 20, 21, Jubal, the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. I've been planning on preaching a little sermon, uh, but I, I probably won't, but I might, uh, entitled, I'm from a bad family, but I got a good gift. Yeah, 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 I come from a bad, I come from a bad family. My daddy killed his brother, mm, but that doesn't stop the fact that I got something in me that God put in me. Thank you, sir. And, 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 and our message, our message is let me bring you back to the one who gave you the gift. Let me bring you back to the one who engineered you for greatness. Let me bring you back to the one who put that capacity in you. Let me bring you back to the one who gave you that brilliance, that genius that you have. It's not coincidental. It's not haphazard. It is the will of the eternal God. He made you. He told Jeremiah that before I formed thee in thy mother's womb, there are two relations. I knew you and I ordained you. I was intimately acquainted with you and I had a purpose for your life. And I need every human being under the sound of my voice to tell every other human being under the sound of your voice that God is not a respectable person. What he told Jeremiah, he's saying to you, I've been intimately acquainted with you and I got a purpose for your life. That's what kingdom of the arts is about. That's what kingdom of God related to humans is about. It is about you finding the one, you rediscovering the one who created you from before the found purpose to you, from before the foundation of the world and put something in you so that you could be a co-laborer with him. What is his labor? In the beginning, God did what? Created the heaven and the earth. What was the purpose of the creating of the heaven and the earth? It was to make a world. He created in chapter one that he 
might make in chapter 2. And I say to you, brothers and sisters, because we are laborers together with God, your calling is to make a world or to make a world better. It is for you to shape some system until that image of that system looks like God, until that image operates like God, until his will is done on the earth as it is in heaven. I'm talking about a heavenly school. I'm talking about a heavenly hospital. I'm talking about heavenly hamburgers. I'm talking about a heavenly marriage. I'm talking about heavenly family. I'm talking about heavenly health. I'm talking, oh, come on church. Please stand for a moment. There is so, so, so much more. Good gracious. Thank you, Lord. Sacred and secular are not opposite. They're complementary. All things are sacred as God originally intended them. I give the illustration sometimes. Exodus chapter 20, God gives the Decalogue, right? And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other God, right? When God talks to them after the Ten Commandments, he keeps talking. He starts talking about hygiene. He's talking about domestic relationships. The same God on the same mountain because it's all sacred. He tells them about how to use the bathroom in the same discourse because it's all sacred to God. Every aspect of your being is sacred to God. What would happen if our children knew? I'll tell you. If I had known that physics and chemistry were sacred to God, I would have invested more in them. I didn't know. I didn't know those were God thoughts. I thought those were things you got to do to pass and, you know. But I did not know that it was the wisdom of God in a book other than this book. I didn't think God had but one book. Somebody needs to tell our children, that no, God has more than one book. He has only one book with final, first and final authority. But those other books, in so far as they contain truth, there is no truth other than God's truth, regardless of where it's found. There is no truth other than God's truth. Paul said it this way, we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. All truth is God's truth. We don't fight doctors our, our ancestors used to. Our ancestors thought that it was a lack of faith to go to the doctor. In the Pentecostal church, if you believe God, you don't go to the doctor. And some of them died prematurely. When the Bible says, we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth, all healing comes from Jehovah Rophika. The earth is the Lord's the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein and once Jesus was glorified he gave a commission and the commission was go into all the world and preach the gospel in Mark teach the gospel in Matthew yeah this is this is our calling. Um, I want to say to you that you are in a powerful place in history. Our civilization teeters on the brink of extinction. The world as we've known it, civility as we've known it, the order of society as we have known it teeters on the brink of extinction. And the thing that's going to keep it from imploding or fully exploding 
is going to be our influence as God saw it in light. Did you hear what I said to you? You are going to have to make the difference. You are going to have to espouse and convey another ideology. Ideas are not removed by dismissing the idea. They are moved by displacing the idea. And you displace an inferior idea with a superior idea. I challenge my brothers and my sisters. I challenge you. Think about your thinking. Approach, approach God's word with a fresh mind. Allow him to be God outside these sacred precincts because your house is a sacred precinct as well. Allow him to teach you how he intends for you to man age in your sphere of influence. How you are to man age the finances. How you are to man age all the various aspects of your life. Ask him to teach you and then let him do it. Let him do it. Um, we're going to pray and then we're going to um, close this. we got to close it. Would you mind taking one another's hand? Tell you what, before we pray, I want you to, uh, to talk to that person and ask him or her, do you sense your perspective challenged to any extent tonight? Do you, do you sense any sort of growth, any sort of expansion, any sort of provocation, any sort of ignition? Oh, I hope so. Oh, oh. You are gifted to influence. You're gifted to rule, not rule over people. You don't rule over people. You lead people. You rule over systems. You rule over territories. You lead people. I will say this and then we'll pray. Personal consecration, well, to be born again is the key to entering the kingdom. Moreover, personal consecration is the key to accessing and appropriating kingdom power. Personal consecration is not so the pastor won't be mad that you didn't go on the fast. Personal consecration is so that you can lay hold upon what's in you. Have you ever sensed there was more in you? Lord, I'm talking to somebody. Have you ever sensed that there was more, more creativity, more innovation, more accomplishment, more achievement, more in-reach, more outreach, more impact, more influence. You sense that that's in you. But how can I get a hold of it? How can I bring it forth? I want you to know personal consecration is the key to you laying hold on what's in you. When I say personal consecration, I mean prayer. But I don't just mean get down and say something. I also mean get down and hear something. I mean, get down and listen for something. God is speaking to you. Take your brother or sister's hand and tell them God is speaking to you. Don't let him talk past you because you're not listening. He's speaking to you. God, you got that hand? He's speaking to you. Mm, he's speaking to you. Tell him, but tell him, consecration is not just missing meals. Tell him, say, the purpose of the consecration is for concentration. It's for, it's for focus. You dangerous when you focused. You know it's the truth. You dangerous when you focused. You didn't hear what I said. 
You're dangerous when you poke them. That class that you said you were stuck, you were stuck and struggling in when you got focused. That concept you said you couldn't understand when you got focused. What happened? You blew it out of the world. Consecration is designed to eliminate distraction because a focus you is a forceful you. A focus you is a fired up you. Jesus. And so consecration, it includes fasting. But fasting is designed to move the distraction. And, and, and you see, your body has got to be disciplined for what's coming. Your body has got to be disciplined for what's coming. Your body cannot be freaky and you in, in, in engage in what God has for you. You got to tell your body, not today, not today, at least not till six today, or not till five. To, come on, come on, come on, come on. Your body has got to obey you. Your body has got to be subject to you. You can't be led by your body. You can't be led by your flesh. You got to make your flesh know who the master is. That's not the only. That's not the only consecration. That's not the only. Uh, Bishop, you you step down. That's fine. But 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 Bishop, when when we have those conversations about precepts and and concepts that relate to our world and that relate to 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 the development of leadership, that's consecration. Some of you don't realize that 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 to have the right conversation with someone who provokes you in the things of God, that's consecration. You didn't hear what I said to you. You need somebody in your life whose words push you to better, push you to more, jerk the slack out of you, jerk the insecurity out of you, jerk the laziness out of you. You don't have anybody like that in your life. Everybody in your life is just fat and greasy. No, you need somebody in your life who, when you leave their presence, it makes you want to do better. When you leave their presence, it makes you want to go somewhere and pray. It makes you want to go somewhere and read. It makes you want to go back to school. It makes you want to get another degree. You don't have anybody like that, then you are not fully consecrated. You may be on a hunger strike, but you're not consecrated. You're not consecrated until you're concentrating. Concentrating on that calling. Concentrating on that gifting. Concentrating on that anointing. Concentrating on the call of God. Concentrating on what you're going to be five years from now. What you're going to be ten years from now. What your children are going to be. What your financial status is going to be. What your health status is going to be. What your marital status is going to be. Come on, church. Come on, church. It's not consecration if you're not concentrating. As iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpens the face of his friend. That's a part of consecration. You show me anybody who has grown in God I'll show you somebody that's got at least one person in their life who pushes them. Whether they know that person personally or not. But there's some mentor, there's some peer, there's somebody somewhere who they're inspired when they see, they, they covet earnestly. Okay. Okay, so, so you got one another's hand. It's Thursday night. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Take that person, take that person. You don't have to hold it hard. Tell them I'm concerned about you. You know how old you are? You're older than you've ever been. And you're as young as you're ever going to be. When are you going to concentrate on God's call on your life? When are you going to stop being scattered? When are you going to stop being scattered? When are you going to stop letting the devil scare you? If he could take you out, he'd have already taken you out. That's just designed to keep you scattered. That distraction, that discouragement is just designed to keep you scatterbrained, scatterminded, distracted, not focused. My brother, my sister, what brought you to God? It was your focus on him and your belief that he has something for you to do in this life. Get that back. Get that back. Get that back.
refuse to be denied, refuse to be deterred, refuse to be delayed. Tell God, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I know I got a good gift and I'm bringing it back. I know I've got a good gift and I'm bringing it back. I know I've got intelligence and I'm bringing it back. I know I've got creativity and I'm bringing it back. I know I can sing a little bit and I'm bringing it back. I know I can organize a little bit and I'm bringing it back. I know fashion a little bit and I'm bringing it back. I know culinary arts a little bit and I'm bringing it back. I don't have what the next man has, but I'm bringing back what you gave me. And I believe that if I bring it back and put it in your hand, you're going to take me. You're going to bless me. You're going to break me. And you're going to give me. And you're going to make me more than enough. And I pray for that man whose hand you're holding. Pray for that woman whose hand you're holding. Speak the blessing of God. Speak the blessing of God. Tell the enemy to lose her. Tell the enemy to lose her. Tell them the kingdom is waiting. The kingdom is waiting. The kingdom of God is waiting. The kingdom of God is waiting for you. Waiting for your witness. Waiting for your life. Waiting for your example. Waiting for your... The world is waiting. The world is waiting. They may not know it, but they're waiting for you. They're waiting to hear your sound. They're waiting to hear your voice. They're waiting to read your book. They're waiting, waiting to use your product. They're waiting to wear your fashion. They are waiting to be taught off the ledge. They're waiting to be counseled. They're waiting to be treated. They're waiting to be consulted by you. Wait a minute, they're waiting to be preached to. They're waiting to be evangelized. They're waiting for your hand to be laid on them. They're waiting for you to prophesy. They're waiting for you to speak another tongue. They're waiting. Rise up. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, sons of God. Rise up, royal priesthood. Rise up, holy nation. Rise up, influencer. Rise, 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 rise up. Jesus is risen, now rise. Jesus is risen, now rise. Shake three hands, tell them I believe that something good is about to happen to you. I believe the kingdom is about to be birthed through you. I believe the kingdom of God is about to be advanced through you. I believe that something God is about to hit your life. Wait a minute, I just felt something come on me here. I said something God is about to come on your life. Shake somebody's hand and say something. God is about to come on your life. Get ready for it, daughter. Get ready for it. The enemy can't hold you back. I know it looked like you did, but he can't hold you back. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Rise up, daughter. Rise up. Tell the devil he's a liar. Your mind belongs to God. Your body belongs to God. And he is able in you to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask of him. The enemy tried to rob you of your gift of possibility, your spirit of possibility. But God said that with him all things are possible. I command you to rise up. 
I command, oh, I command you to rise up. I command you to be made whole. When the enemy tried to hit your eyes and blind you, God is giving you new sight. God is healing your perspective. In the name of Jesus, you're going to see life like you've never seen it before. You're going to see yourself like you've never seen yourself before. You're going to see God like you've never seen it before. Somebody open up your mouth and say something good is about to happen to you. Something good is about to happen to you. Tell them I declare that something good. Hey! Strongholds are being broken. Strongholds are being damaged. Small, small minds, small minds are being expanded. I can, I can do all things to Christ. Be seated, everyone, just a moment. Lord Jesus. All right. Listen, we're going to honor God with a gift. I've got to let you go. I, you know, I've got to let you go. Facebook, YouTube, I pray you've been edified. I pray you've been encouraged. I really do. Just be seated for a moment. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm your witness. I'm your witness. I'm your ambassador. I've got to say what you said. Thank you for the privilege. I believe somebody's not going to be the same going out of here. Oh. Oh. You're not going to bow to the enemy's image. That image that you got in yourself of being a failure. That image that you have in yourself of being less than. That image that you have in yourself of being inferior. You don't have to bow to that image. You tell Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Our God who we serve is able with expectation that this is not a monologue this is a dialogue
expect God to speak to you because he is speaking to you. I'm talking about my soul. Every time you pray, he... what you want to talk about. I don't know, but 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 just try it sometime. Find and find an old business person in your city, like maybe a realtor, and go ask them about a piece of property. This is what'll happen. They'll say, oh come on in, have a seat. Say, what you say your name was again? Who your people is? What school did you go to? Did you know John? No, not, not John Green, John Purple. You, you didn't know John? That boy could play some ball. I don't know where John is right now. I saw one of his cousins last. So you sit there for 30 minutes talking about everything but what you went in there to talk about. That's the dance of business. That's why they go on the golf course. You gotta dance the dance. That's why they go, mm, that's why they go to dinner, lunch. It's the dance, come on insurance man, it's the dance. How old are your children? Your mother still living? What did you think about that game last night? And then at last, they finally go to what you wanna talk about. Well, God is a businessman. And many times I found that when he starts talking to me, it has nothing to do with what I went to talk to him about. But I found out that if I let him get off his mind, what's on his mind? No, he said, he'll give me the answer for what's on my mind. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why you don't hear it is because you don't recognize it. Then I'm about to say, because you asking God how I'm going to pay the rent, all my money spent, and he's talking to you about what city you going to take. He's talking to you about what book you going to write. He's talking to you about how you going to help somebody. Get your gift, I got mine. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Somebody's encouraged to go forward. And we command every honor we'll see to be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please bring your gifts and then hurry to your seat. Let me dismiss you. We got a, a snack for you. Please don't leave if you don't have to.
sanctified musician. All right, listen. We're going out this door. The snack has been prepared. Please avail yourself. There's no cost, uh, no price. Just avail yourself. Listen, tomorrow, hear me just, just before you before you go. I, 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 please now, don't don't you all don't you all abandon us tomorrow now. You know, shouting out the door and I won't see you. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, tomorrow, you may I have a copy of the program. Anybody got one there nearby? Thank you. Um, and um, we, we made a certain number, and they may have been uh, put in the folders, maybe not, but if, if they're not in the folders, let everybody have one. If they're in the folders, we'll have more tomorrow. But listen, lead guitar, bass guitar, dance, choir, and praise and worship will be together. In fact, let's go back. Lead guitar, Mason Millerson, bass guitar, Ahmad Johnson. Children and adult dance, Elder Althea Peterson. Uh, choir, praise and worship, Pastor Wendy Wyatt. Uh, graphic design, Minister Derek Brown. Minister Derek Brown does 99.9% .9 of all the graphics that you see uh, among us, CCFM and all the rest. Um, so you know he's good. Um, Elder Adrian Nesbitt will be doing keys. Elder Adrian is a legend on the keyboards. Um, Elder Elijah Sumo is here tonight. Wave your hand, Elder. Um, and some of you have seen the great videographic work that he's done, right? For us and for many others. Well, your videographer team needs to be here tomorrow. He'll be teaching. Um, all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, uh, audio and sound media. Um, Brother Kevin McKeithen and Brother David Knight, our own Brother David Knight, uh, be here with them, be there with them. Um, music industry, that, that's after service tomorrow. Organ, Brother Michael Blanding. Percussion, Brother Tyler Potts. Um, visual arts, Brother Steve Wilson. And the children's general session, Sister Latria O'Bonner and those who will be assisting her. Stan Sister O'Bonner, for those who don't know her. So all of the children have sessions. If they're not a part of the dance, they'll be a part of Sister O'Bonner's session. All right? And so uh, the praise and worship session will be held here. The, um, all the other sessions will be held at the high school. Now, Sister O'Bonner with the children, would it be all right in other words, do you feel like it's conducive for you all to remain in this space tomorrow, or do you need more space? If you need more, we'll go over to the school, but it's going to be your discretion. Okay. Okay. All right. And, and, and one thing about it, everybody knows children are on campus at the church, um, and, uh, and choir and praise and worship are on campus at the church. All the other groups will be at the, uh, at the high school. And, and we will have people here directing people and people there directing people. There'll be a snack after service tomorrow night as tonight. And then Saturday morning, there will be a pre-snack um, as you go come at 1030 for fellowship and the snack. At 11, classes will begin. And then at 1230, there will be a sit-down lunch, uh, a hot lunch. And we want you to be a part of that. And then come on um, Saturday for the close. Now tomorrow our main speaker, like in this segment, will be Elder David Bratton. And um, he's not coming to try to prove how many keys he can change. He's coming to talk about how his good gift became the perfect gift as he gave it over to the Lord. He's going to talk about his journey. Is, is that, that good? Uh, yeah, it is. It's very good. How, how many of you were with us the years during which he taught every praise here? during Kingdom of the Arts before it became the hit with Bishop Walker. Absolutely. How do, you, how do you remain faithful to God like that when it looks like it's just a little thing and now it's a worldwide phenomenon? Wouldn't you want to hear that? I'd, I'd want to hear that. And then, um, and there's some of your songwriters, you, you literally need to know, all right? And then Saturday, Elder Juanita Francis will be the, the, the teacher 
on Saturday for the whole group. She'll be teaching on worship, praise, how the Lord leads her. And we have a surprise guest, so to speak. Um, Brother Kalante Gavin is going to join us. He's written a new book, and he's going to come and talk about the message of his book and so forth. And, uh, and so it's going to be good. And, of course, Sister Elder Francis is going to stay with us and preach Sunday morning as well. So it's going to be powerful. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Please stand, everyone. Please stand, everyone. Let me ask you tonight, have you been benefited from this session? Have you, have you benefited? Okay. okay. I encourage you, please help us. We cannot, we can't coerce anybody, but help us to get the word out. And if you really have been blessed, encourage somebody else to come. Now, I will not be doing, I will not be teaching any session tomorrow. Um, uh, I'll be helping facilitate, but I won't be teaching. It's a Saturday, pastors, I will be sharing during the breakout time with pastors and your spouses. Um, over at the high school, we'll be in the media center. And um, the, the rooms are listed. Rooms are listed. All right, I think that's it. I think that's it. Does anybody have anything else? Okay, I think that's it. I honor my wife, Pastor Melinda. Thank the Lord for that. Please continue praying for her as she, uh, a week from tonight, she'll be, she will have stood and declared the word of the Lord, God willing, uh, in Cincinnati with Bishop Hilton. Please pray for her and with her that the Lord will have his way in her life and in all of our lives. Amen. Okay. When I will have dismissed, please make a beeline for the, the snack. Make sure you get something for your child and so forth. I'm going to remain here just a moment. Um, I asked for those who are facilitated. Um, somebody will read the names out. Um, if, if, uh, yeah, somebody, if, if you will, please get the lead mic, one of the lead mics, and read this list out. And, and, and um, those who are facilitating or those who want to help, just see me. Um, and also those who have questions, we didn't do the questions as we would like to have done them, but see me. I'll be here right up front. And Bishop Marcus Benjamin, we thank you, sir. Where's Bishop? There he is. Let's let Bishop know we appreciate him. Over these past several years, Bishop has been a, even, an even greater blessing to this ministry. Don't you agree? He's been an even greater blessing. All right. Father, we have uh, attempted to share in one sitting, in one sitting, what we have held a full Kingdom of God seminar over a three and even four day span. We've tried to consolidate that into one session. And so I know we've left so much undone, so much unsaid. We didn't get to talk about the daimonion. We didn't get to talk about the sons of God, the daughters of men. So many, so many things. We didn't get to talk about uh, fivefold ministry uh, and the grace upon the fivefold, how it applies to all believers. But thank you for this that we did receive tonight. Let lives be ever more impacted. Carry us to our homes and various other destinations safely. Hallelujah. Bring us back together at the appointed hour. And Father, we will be careful to give you and you alone all the glory, the honor, and the praise. These blessings we ask in the name of the great God who is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Pastor, step this way. Brother, step this way. Will you all step forward, please, and face the congregation. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this is the first time we've been in a worship service in which I can say to you that we are presenting to you, Pastor, for the first time in this house, uh, our brother or deacon or whatever he's going to be, and he is Kent and Mrs. Pastor Lori. Wilson, can we thank the Lord for the tour again? Come on, celebrate God for that. Congratulations again. 
Congratulations again. God bless you. Praise God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amen. We are what the Word of God says that we are. We have what the Word of God says that we have. We can do what the Word of God says that we can do, for we are committed to bring pleasure to Christ's heart and fame to his name. Amen. Please, make your way. Make your way. And um, he'll, brother will read those names. Who's going to read them? Read the names for us. Oh, sister, okay. All right, then. All right. Yes, the volunteers, if you'll wait in section, what's that, three? Wait in section three. I'll speak to you in just a moment. Get those names. God bless you all. These are the facilitators, brothers and sisters. Cortland Wood, Corey Robinson, Tierra Scarborough, Katre Washington, Javion David, Michael Myers.